Yeah, welcome to the last day of the school. It's the day of quantum computing. I'm Ricardo, Ricardo Mengoni, work at Cineca Quantum Computing Lab. And I'm gonna give you like this broad overview about quantum computing. We're gonna start from the basics. We're gonna see like, uh, what's the status of the hardware, of the software and the ecosystem and what are the projects in uh, Europe and worldwide also a little bit. And so at the end, hopefully you will be able to understand something about quantum computing. And, and if you're interested and if you want to work in this topic, maybe you will be able to know um, where, where to go to, to ask for resources or help. Okay. So first of all, like a couple of words about uh, my organization. So Cineca. Cineca is basically the HPC center in, uh, in Italy. So it's basically an organization made up of several Italian universities and research centers. And so it was born in 1969 and it's always worked with uh, uh, technologies, state-of-the-art technologies, okay? Uh, for the support of scientific research, both in industry and academia. And okay, right now, uh, so this is the status of uh, Cineca right now. So we are hosting entity and we manage the Leonardo supercomputer, which is pre-exascale supercomputer, and actually is the fourth most powerful supercomputer in the world. Uh, it's in the top 500 list of the most powerful uh, supercomputer, and these are the like the cores, number of cores, and uh, performance okay, of, of the device. But actually, I'm part of the uh, quantum computer lab at Cineca. So what we do at Cineca is like. So the mission is the same. So we support universities, uh, industries, and uh, also we collaborate with quantum computer startups. And we also provide internship programs for the moment only to uh, for students that are enrolled in uh, in, uh, in uh, Italian institutes. Courses like this one, and uh, uh, we organized last year a conference. Uh, HPC QC, so a performance computing in quantum computing, and we're gonna uh, organize again uh, in December uh, 2023. So if you want to know more, like visit our website. There are several courses and material regarding quantum computing, and or drop me a line or uh, write me a link. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, let's start with with this question. So I know. Uh, I mean, we have a different background, so uh, the people here have, have a different background. So yeah, as I told you, we're gonna start from, from the basics. And <clears throat> okay, and let's uh, ask ourselves this question. So what is quantum computing in general? Okay, and if you um, don't understand everything uh, that I say today is fine, uh, it, but at least uh, I want you to uh, to get okay the, the following uh, concept. Ah, no, sorry, before, before that. Okay, so this is like the overview of the of the presentation. So uh, uh, I stole this from uh, a YouTuber. Uh, so it's Domain of Science, the, the YouTube channel. And it's like, a, I think he's a quantum physicist. He worked in a quantum computing startup uh, for, for some time. And he does this map of uh, several topics. So this is the map of quantum computing. And yes, we are gonna, do we have the, Okay, nice. Okay. So, okay, we're gonna start from, from the top uh, uh, left part. So from the, re, 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 from, from the basics. Uh, so what's the difference with classical computing? Then we're gonna go uh, a little bit on the right. So we're gonna see what are the models of quantum computing. Uh, so and um, what are the, the algorithms, okay? Which are here. Algorithms are here in, in pink. Uh, what are the possibilities uh, of quantum computer? What are the application? And also something about physical realizations of, of the hardware. And after that, okay, then we will talk about a project and stuff like that. So uh, I was telling you, um, if you don't understand any, anything, uh, what I say is fine, but at least I want you to, to get the following things, which is this one. So. A quantum computer is not simply like a smaller or faster version of a traditional classical laptop or uh, HPC supercomputer. It's something uh, fundamentally different. 
So it's actually quantum computing a fundamentally uh, a new paradigm for information processing and computation. So um, uh, why? Because it's based on the principle of, of quantum physics, quantum mechanics, okay? Everything that we use today, so um, classical computing is based on classical okay, information theory, let's say. So, and we have to change that uh, and substitute it with, with quantum physics. Uh, so it's a, a fundamentally new uh, paradigm. So this means that we um, quantum algorithms uh, really don't look like classic classical algorithms. So uh, what we need is a completely different approach, uh, which is required to solve uh, uh, problems, uh, which are interesting. Uh, and it's a di completely different approach because at the end you, you have to use uh, quantum mechanics to solve problems which is something that you uh, normally uh, don't do uh, in classical uh, computing. And uh, so that's why, I mean, there is no uh, simple way to port uh, applications uh, to, to quantum processing units. So you need just, just to, uh, maybe the problem is the same, but then the, the, the algorithm is completely different. So you don't port like application, like uh, it may happen with, with other technologies where the algorithm is the same, you just okay, write it in a, a way that the technology understands it. So, but okay, uh, let's, take, let's take a step back for, for a moment. And yeah, let's try uh, to, uh, so let's ask this question, it's a bit, a bit more fundamental. So what is, uh, at the end, uh, quantum mechanics? So maybe helpful for those of you that don't have like the physics background. And here I'm going to cite a guy uh, who is uh, Scott Aronson. He's like a computer scientist and working on quantum computing, quantum computational complexity. So it comes from a, a, um, from a computer science background. So, uh, but still, he is one of the leading uh, researchers in quantum computing. And I mean, uh, here there is like his TED talk where he said, like, if you remove all the physics, uh, then quantum mechanics is just probabilities plus uh, the minus sign. Uh, that's because uh, in quantum mechanics, you have like uh, uh, complex numbers. So when you square them and you get the probabilities, you get some minus sign some, somewhere. And so that's all you need to, uh, if you don't know quantum mechanics, that's all you need to, um, to know. So probabilities plus minus sign, complex numbers, let's say. And also, okay, of course, some uh, linear algebra is involved. And uh, I mean, just it's just one, sl one slide about the formalism in quantum mechanics. And you have, uh, you, you have to know um, if, you, if you work on this field that I mean, there are vectors, so which represent the state of a quantum system, uh, which are represented with, usually with the psi. With the, with the bracket, which is also called a uh, cat. So this is the, the notation for, for vectors. So uh, they are complex vectors. So each, each element is a complex number. And if you uh, join together like multiple quantum system, you have to, to apply the tensor product, which increases the dimension of, of your vector basically. Yeah. And uh, you end up so if you if you add two quantum system of side n you you end up with one vector which is size n squared and then all the operation that you do all the uh, operators that uh, are present in quantum mechanics are either unitary operators which have this uh, property or Hermitian operators which have uh, this other product, uh, property and here so this one this symbol is usually called dagger which is the uh, conjugate transpose. Okay. And, and that's, yeah, basically, yeah, all you have to know to, to understand uh, quantum algorithms. So, okay, let's, let's go on with the postulates so of quantum mechanics and um, quantum computing actually inherit the, the postulate from, from quantum mechanics. And let's see how, uh, so what's the difference with, with classical computation? So, uh, and you can find, I mean, uh, I will always have like reference uh, here, some reference uh, 
or archive paper that you can you can check to to study more in detail this topic. So the first postulate concerns the unit of information. And you know that classically, the unit of classical information is the bit. So it's something uh, that can be represented as, so it's like a, a switch. So it can be something that could be either on or off. It can be represented with these two uh, basis uh, vectors. So the zero and the one uh, state. So the bit could be either zero state or the one state. Okay, quantumly instead, um, uh, to a given quantum system is associated in general in Hilbert space. And uh, is the state of a quantum system, so uh, yeah, the configuration, let's say, of a quantum system is a vector in this Hilbert space. What's the difference? Okay, mathematically, it's pretty uh, straightforward, straightforward. So you don't have just one, only one basis uh, vector but you have a linear combination of the two. So in general, you could have some uh, generic vector alpha and beta, where alpha and beta are, are complex numbers. And that's also, um, and the unit of information is the, the qubit, so the quantum bit, and the state of a bit looks, looks like this, okay? It's like the, the generalization of, of, of a bit to the quantum world, okay? So uh, alpha, beta vector. Very simple. So um, there is also the, 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 so I told you already that these are complex numbers and there is also this strange relation, which means that the modulus square, uh, the sum of these two uh, alpha and beta modulus square should be equal to one, okay? There is some property that uh, you need to remember and we will uh, see later on why uh, this is important. And, Okay, it's also true that you can uh, rewrite, let's say, the state of a qubit in this way, okay, using a polar coordinate. And actually, you can visualize also the state of a, of a quantum bit. So the state of a quantum bit is actually a point on this uh, unit radius uh, surface, uh, the surface of this sphere. It could be any point uh, on this surface. But uh, if you look closely, I mean, the for example, the classical bits, zero, one, are only the, the north and the south pole of the uh, of this uh, uh, of this uh, uh, surface. Okay, it could be only these two points. Why the qubit can can rotate and uh, have an arbitrary uh, uh, position? Okay, on, on the on the sphere. Okay. The second postulate concern composite system, so which means when you add together multiple bits or qubits. So classically, you know that uh, if you have n bits, then the state of these n bits, so the configuration of these n bits could be one of these possibilities here. So you could have like, or, uh, like your bits are all in the zero, zero state, or bits could be all in the one state, or it could be any of the two to the n possibilities that, that you could have. Quantumly, okay, things are uh, different, but not so much complicated. So what you have is actually a linear combination of all the classical configurations, okay? Again, with complex numbers, which whose modulus square sum up to one, okay? Why uh, is that? Because uh, as we have uh, seen before, okay, the, the space associated with this composite system with the multiple qubits, so multiple sub, uh, quantum subsystem is just the tensor product of each individual subsystem, of the uh, space of each individual subsystem. Okay, the main uh, consequence of this is uh, a concept that maybe uh, you heard sounds somewhere. Uh, this quantum entanglement, okay? Well, let's start with a, a, uh, defining what is not quantum entanglement. So a state that looks like this, so which can be factored or can be um, uh, expressed as a, pro as a tensor product between uh, the states of each subsystem, then this is not an entangled state, actually it's a product state. While, a state that cannot be written in this way. So 
uh, a state where you cannot um, you cannot split the global uh, state of the composite system in terms of uh, uh, by means of uh, uh, single uh, by, by means of the, uh, the state of the single subsystems. Okay, so in in some sense, like um, you have that the uh, uh, the whole thing, so the um, the uh, the global state. Okay, it's more than the, than the product of, of each part, and this uh, the entangled states. So, what are some examples of quantum states? So, probably you know this. So, uh, this is Schrödinger. This is a Schrödinger's cat. So, there is uh, like a a, a thought experiment that Schrodinger did uh, with his cat. So imagine to have like a, some a quantum, uh, I'm sorry, some points, I mean, some killing machine, uh, which was, uh, uh, which uh, releases some poison, depending on the state of uh, a quantum system here. So this means if you put like your, your uh, Kate in this box, so, uh, the the cat would correlate to to the to the killing machine, which uh, is governed by by a quantum state here, and then you would create some quantum entangled state where the cat is both uh, dead and alive, depending on on the state of the of the uh, of the killing machine. Let's say. So that's the Schrodinger cat, but also mathematically. Uh, you have something that looks like this. So th these are all entangled states. And, and we have, uh, these are called Bell state. So here, for example, the first one is the simplest one. You have zero, zero plus one, one. So the first zero refers to the, to, so the first number, sorry, refers to the first qubit. The second number refers to the second qubit. So in the zero, zero here, zero is the first qubit zero in the second qubit. Here, one, one is one first qubit, one second qubit. So there is no way to uh, split the two, uh, the state of the two qubit, okay, one, one from apart, okay? So, so you cannot uh, obtain a product state like this, okay? Uh, starting from, so that's why these are, are called entangled state, okay? Then the third part is state change. So you know that classically, so if you have your register of classical bits, then um, state change, so you can modify uh, the configuration of your classical bits via logic gates, okay? And that's how you do computation. So you have, uh, of course, the AND, OR, XOR, and so on, uh, logic gates that enable you to go from okay, one configuration, maybe the uh, zero, zero, 001 configuration to the 111 configuration, okay? And that's state change. Okay, quantumly, things are a little bit different and everything is governed by the Schrodinger equation. So actually, um, Schrodinger equation is this thing here. So in quantum, uh, Mechanics, okay, um, you, uh, the state of some quantum system at time t uh, is equal to some unitary matrix applied to the state of the system at time zero, okay? So every state change, state change uh, is described by a unitary operator, okay? And the H here is also called the Hamiltonian. So H uh, tells you, gives you information about how the um, the energy of the of the quantum associated with, with the quantum system and so of course yeah the, the evolution follows like uh, using this rule like the the behavior of the energy of, of the system and that's a unitary operator but actually uh, i mean more simply uh, you can uh, define a set of unitaries that enable you to perform computation. And uh, these are also called the quantum gates. Gates, So like logical gates that uh, 
allow you to perform classical computing. You have quantum logical gates uh, that allow you to uh, perform uh, uh, quantum computation. So and you have different possibilities. You have single qubit gates, uh, which is like the bit flip gate or uh, the face flip or the Adamar gate or multiple qubits gates, okay? So one very important gate is the Adamar gate. Uh, whose, um, so the Adamar gate, if applied to a classical bit zero, for example, returns a, um, a, the qubit state in uh, quantum superposition. So maybe I didn't tell you this, which was very important. Uh, okay, a state in this form here. So linear combination of this kind it's often called a quantum superposition, so which means a linear combination of classical states. So this is like quantum superposition states. And the Adamar gate is very important because it allows you to go from a state uh, which is not uh, in superposition uh, and to change it into a state which is in quantum superposition. Okay, and that's the uh, Hadamard gate. And we, okay, you, you can also have yeah, uh, control X gate, so uh, where one qubit is the control, and depending on the state on the first qubit, uh, the second one re receives uh, a flip, for example. Okay, then uh, the last part, so it's measurement. So this is the, so so far I guess it's more or less fine. I mean, guys, if you have questions, please uh, ask questions during the talk. The uh, last part concerns measurements. So this is like the wildest uh, thing about quantum computing, quantum mechanics in general. And you know that classically, okay, let's say I give you one, one bit and I don't tell you uh, what is the state of, of this bit? So what is the, configura the configuration of, of the bit? So what you could do to, in order to, to understand uh, the state of the bit is to measure it. So the measurement of, uh, so if you're given this bit, the measurement returns the state of the bit with certainty. So you know that when I gave you uh, the, the, the bit, the state before the measurement was zero, for example, then you measure it, and you get the outcome zero, so you know that the state is in uh, the qubit is in the in the zero state, and after the measurement, uh, nothing changed. Okay, this the bit is still in in the zero state. Okay, so the measurement do not affect uh, the state of a bit. So quantumly, uh, things are very different because uh, let's say that I give you um, some qubit, so some quantum bit in quantum superposition, so. Uh, whose state looks like this, and uh, you don't know uh, what kind of uh, state uh, this is. So we have alpha and beta, which are some some numbers. So in order, um, so if you want to gain some information about this qubit, about the state of this qubit, you need to measure it, of course. But then measurement, measuring, uh, measuring a quantum bit returns a bit state with some probability. So I give you a, a, a qubit, but then when you measure, you only get classical information, uh, okay? So in, some, in this sense, me the measurement process um, collapses, let's say, the state of the quantum system to a state, uh, to a classical state. So if you measure it, you, don't, you, don't, you never see uh, the quantum superposition, when you measure it, you only see uh, uh, its classical part, okay? So when you measure, you can get zero or one, okay? With some probability. So the outcome is probabilistic. And the probability of getting zero or one, uh, actually, if you look, depends on the coefficients here of the quantum superposition. Um, so the probability is actually the modulus square, of the of this coefficient, and that's why, um, uh, as we've seen before, um, 
the modulus of alpha square plus modulus of beta square should sum up to one because these are probabilities and probabilities always sum up to one. And so, okay. Um, the first difference is that measure with, with the classical setting is that measurement returns um, uh, returns uh, a, a, a bit state. So returns a classical state with some probability. So it's probabilistic. The second thing is that the measurement affects like the state of the qubit because after the measurement, uh, you do not have the quantum state anymore, but uh, the state is uh, uh, has changed. And the state after the qubit, after the measurement, uh, is going to be zero or one. Okay, so you lose uh, the quantumness uh, after after the measurement, and you are left with uh, probabilities and classical outcomes. So, um, more formally, let's say to any uh, physical quantity that you can observe is associated a an Hermitian operator, and uh, so Hermitian matrix, let's say. And all the possible uh, outcomes that you could have are all the possible eigenvalues of this operator, and uh, the the state of of the qubit after the measurement uh, will become a, a classical state, and uh, the state which is represented with this uh, cat O of i uh, is going to be uh, is actually an eigenvector of this. Uh, uh, quantity that you want to measure. For example, here an observable means like quantity that you want to measure, like uh, momentum of the part of some particle, for example. Okay. So the thing is that I want to understand here is that uh, before the measurement, uh, so you have this quantum superposition. After the measurement, you get a classical outcome with some probability. Okay. So now that you know everything about uh, the post-wave quantum mechanics, so that's all you need to know to do quantum computation. So it's for things, you have qubits instead of bits, which are basically only linear combination of bit states. Uh, and then uh, if you want to join multiple qubits, you have to perform tensor product. And sometimes happens that you have uh, entangled states. Uh, then everything that you do uh, should be expressed, every operation that you do should be a unitary matrix. And finally, uh, when you measure, uh, remember that uh, the measurement destroys the quantumness of the system. And what you get in output is some uh, classical uh, bit string with some probability. So there are several uh, models of quantum computation that are uh, equivalent, polynomially equivalent. So we have the mm, gate model quantum computation, uh, which is like the most uh, popular one, and uh, all the others. Okay, it's like, uh, so okay, we have gate model quantum computation also called like uh, circuit-based uh, quantum computation, then adiabatic, measurement-based, and topological. But uh, like 80% of the papers are written uh, are about like gate model quantum computation. Then we have, I don't know, 50% about this. And then, uh, yeah, the rest, 5% uh, is these two, probably. OK, but so these are like different ways, uh, different models of quantum computation, which are equivalent. So you could, uh, let's say, uh, you could. Uh, Maybe you have your quantum algorithm that is uh, written uh, in uh, using the quantum, uh, the gate model quantum computation. There is always some mapping to all the other models. Okay. Um, so the, we're going to focus more on, on the first one, which is the most uh, popular, as, as I told you. But in the first one, as you can see, uh, gates, so the gates that we have seen are, are used to perform computation. Well, in the adiabatic case, uh, it's a bit, a bit more like associate, um, related to uh, physics process, physical processes. 
So in adiabatic quantum computation, uh, you expect the fact that nature uh, by default uh, tends to go to the lowest energy state. So if you want to solve some problem uh, in, um, in adiabatic quantum computation, you need to express it as the uh, energy associated with uh, with some system so that in such a way that mm, the ground state so the lowest energy state of your system also gives you information about the problem that you want to solve and this is done via okay going from a, an initial system which is easy to to implement and uh, smoothly changing it adiabatically to to the problem that you want to start Okay, then we have measurement based quantum computation, which uh, works in this way. So you basically create a huge uh, quantum superposition, a huge entangled state, and you measure uh, this uh, huge entangled state up in an appropriate way in order to perform computation. And then you have the uh, wildest, uh, the topological quantum computation thing, so which is based on particles which are not. Really, particles are called uh, uh, anions, which are quasi particles. Um, and anions have the property um, that uh, if you look at the trajectory of these particles in time, so if you exchange the position of these particles, uh, you can see them as, as, as break, I mean, you can see the trajectory as uh, lines. And so uh, if you exchange the position, you are doing something like braiding their their trajectories, and the braiding is what per, is what that is the thing that performs the the quantum computation. Okay, it is topological because um, all, uh, the the only important things is like the topology of this braid, and, and uh, it's uh, it is um, not important. I mean, it's uh, how to say. Um, uh, it's resistant to to local uh, noise. Okay, that does not change the topology of, of the overall uh, uh, computation. Okay, so we're we're going to focus more on on the gate model, which is the simplest one probably, and also the the most the most famous one. So as I told you, uh, uh, this model of computation is also called like quant uh, circuit based quantum computation because uh, this picture here looks like a, a classical circuit, okay? And we have instead, okay, we have quantum circuits. So quantum circuits, so uh, if you want to write a quantum algorithm, you actually have to write some quantum circuit. So, uh, and uh, we already seen that any operation that you do is some unitary operation. So at the end, your algorithm, uh, your quantum algorithm is gonna be some unitary matrix that you, apply to your, your qubits. So in general, given n input qubits, your quantum algorithm is gonna be a unitary of dimension two to the n times two to the n, of course. Um, so, but, okay, more practically, um, a quantum algorithm, so a quantum circuit usually looks like this. So you have, uh, Qubits, a register of qubits instead of bits. So register of qubits, uh, you initialize them in some way. So uh, maybe they are all in the zero state or they might be in some other quantum superposition state. And then you apply the gate that we've seen before, the, the Atomar gate, the X gate, the control not gate, in order to do something smart. And then of course you measure the qubits. And measurement uh, uh, gives a measuring them uh, I mean, collapses the state of the quantum system, and what you get in output is just classical state. So you get in output classical bits, which are either zero or one, with some probability. So this is what a quantum algorithm look like, and you, you maybe started to understand that these are very different from. Uh, classical computation, so there is no uh, easy porting of your application to to quantum computing because you have to completely rethink uh, your 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 algorithm. And of course, so since the outcome is probabilistic, you, are, you need to run 
this algorithm multiple times and measure multiple times in order to reconstruct the probabilities uh, in output. Okay, and usually, what uh, I mean, in some sense, uh, often happens that the the uh, the the you want in output uh, you want the solution to your problem. For example, let's say that. Um, the solution to my problem is the zero zero configuration, and you want this state here to have the highest probability. Okay. Now, uh, let's start to um, talk about uh, why. Uh, what so? Okay, this is like the models of quantum computation, but what are the benefits of quantum computing? Okay, from, starting from like a theoretical uh, perspective. So the most important, um, yeah, probably uh, you already heard about quantum parallelism. And uh, this is at the core of uh, uh, quantum algorithm. And that's uh, the reason why quantum algorithm could achieve a, a speed up uh, with respect to classical uh, algorithms. Okay. So, but before um, talking about uh, quantum parallelism, there is one simple concept that you need to understand, which is uh, the oracle function or uh, um, function evaluation. Okay. So basically, if you are given some some function on uh, on uh, uh, which inputs some some bit string and outputs some some other bit string, then an oracle is uh, a quantum algorithm, a quantum circuit, or so in general it's a unitary. So that uh, an algorithm, so to evaluate such such function in a quantum way is given by some unitary U of F, which works in this way. So you're given an input to registers of qubits, a register of qubit X, register of qubits uh, Y, and if you apply u of f, so uh, this oracle, this function that evaluates this, this quantum uh, uh, black box that evaluates this function f, uh, so th that's u of f, what you get in output is x, so which is not changed, and y, um, the state of the qubit, of the second qubit of the second register has changed. And uh, is uh, um, contains information about uh, the function evaluated on the input x. So since okay everything is bit strings, what you get here is the summation modulus too. Okay. So again, uh, yeah, the oracle is something like it's like a, a quantum black box that is, is unitary, some 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 unitary that is used to implement some function, and the definition is like. This one, uh, so this one is quite it's quite easy to to, to understand. Okay, now let's talk about quantum parallelism and consider the following algorithm. Okay, so uh, it's very simple algorithm that starts with with uh, two qubits in the zero state. So start with uh, the two qubits in a classical state, so the zero zero state. We apply Hadamard. To the first qubit, and then this oracle, this function evaluation oracle U of F, which is another quantum black box. Okay. So, and let's see, let's do like the step by step analysis of this circuit. So, you start from a zero zero state, then you apply the other mark only to the first one. So, the other mark we have seen before that other mark. Um, is able to create uh, uh, quantum superposition. So we go from uh, the zero state here. Okay, you can see this here. So Adamar is able to transform the zero state into a uh, quantum superposition state. So a, a linear combination of zero plus one with uh, uh, the same coefficient, which is one over square root of two. Okay, so the state after the application of the first Adamar is this one, while the second qubit is uh, 
is still the same. So we uh, do nothing to, to the second qubit. Then let's see what happens when, okay, we can rewrite this uh, in this way. We just multiply zero uh, by this now, by this one and this other, and we get uh, this state here. So let's now apply U of F. Okay, if you remember like the, the definition of U of F, okay, and since everything is uh, it's linear algebra, so you apply U of F to the zero zero state, and what you get is zero F of zero. And if you apply U of F to the one zero state, you get one F of one. So what you got here is some state that could be, uh, so it's a quantum superposition state, and it's actually a remarkable state because um, with a single application of U of F, so you just need to apply U of F once in order to uh, uh, create a quantum superposition, so a linear combination state, uh, which contains information on, on both, uh, in, on all the possible inputs, of, okay, on both f of zero and f of one, okay? So, um, yeah, we created okay, this quantum superposition containing information about both f of zero and f of one uh, with a single uh, application of, f of, f of u of f, okay? And um, however, okay, we know that, we have seen before that if we measure at this point, so the state at, at this point is actually uh, useless, okay, because uh, we know that um, parallelism alone is not useful because measure, measuring uh, this state here will return some random input. So uh, either f of zero or f of one. So you're not doing better than the classical case. So um, the thing is that quantum algorithms exploit this, uh, this quantum superposition, this quantum parallelism in uh, a smart way. So, so you combine quantum parallelism with uh, uh, information, let's say extraction from, from this quantum state uh, in a smart way in order to uh, usually obtain information about f, about the function f, um, with, with some speed up with respect to, to uh, uh, the classical case. So, uh, so the, the, the thing that I want you to, to, to understand is just, okay, quantum algorithm is this quantum parallelism to solve some problems, okay, not all the uh, classical problems, uh, not, not all the problems are, are solved uh, faster on a quantum computer, but some of them could be solved faster with a quantum computer, so with a quantum algorithm, uh, rather than uh, with a classical algorithm. Okay, so let's see some, some examples now of, of quantum algorithms. Okay, the, the, the first example, so uh, the quantum algorithm that was, so the most famous one, um, that was developed in uh, the 90s, probably 1994, uh, is the Shor algorithm. The Shor algorithm addresses this uh, problem, which is a, uh, the problem of factorization. Probably you know that. So this problem uh, is defined in this way. So uh, you're given a number n, uh, which is a huge number. So it's uh, usually a co-prime. And you need to find the two prime numbers uh, such that uh, you have to, to find the two prime numbers P and Q that multiplied gives you this N, okay? This is the, uh, like the inverse of the, the multiplication. You know that multiplying two numbers is uh, it's easy. So multiplying this P and Q is easy and you get easily get N. But if you do it uh, in the opposite direction, so if you're given N and you want to find P and Q, it's very, very hard. So it's so hard that uh, the best classical algorithm that we have for this problem requires exponential time in the size of n. So uh, that's why this problem is used in uh, uh, cybersecurity. So uh, probably you know at the core of, of today's uh, uh, cybersecurity, there is the RSA crypto system. 
uh, whose security is based exactly on, on this fact. So it's based on the fact that we are not able to factor in uh, a uh, short time uh, a number n, which is uh, a big number. Okay. So the security of our world, let's say, of every transaction of your uh, browser, okay, whenever you you serve, whenever you you go on in uh, uh, on the web, let's say, is uh, guaranteed by the RSA crypto system, and it works because uh, we are not able to solve this problem, the factorization problem in uh, in time that is. Uh, uh, humanly acceptable. So in, as I told you, in the 1994, so we have this guy, Peter Shore, which uh, came up with, with this idea of using the quantum algorithm uh, to solve the factorization problem. And he came up with this circuit. So with this algorithm here, we start, start from some initial set of qubits which are all in the zero state, except the last one that is in the one state. And then they apply Hadamard, then some control operations, so control unitaries in general. And there's this subroutine here, which is called the quantum Fourier transform, which is very famous uh, uh, quantum subroutine or quantum algorithm. Then okay, the, result, uh, state, the setting state here is measured. And thanks to this state, um, so this state gives you the uh, ability to factor large numbers in polynomial time. So this is like a, an exponential speed up with respect to the best classical algorithm. So we know, for example, that the best classical algorithm that we have for factorization is the number field sieve. And uh, the runtime, so which means the number of operations that, that you have to do on a classical computer, scale like uh, the exp uh, an, is an exponential in the size of the number n that you want to factor. While the short algorithm is, is only polynomial in uh, the number, uh, in the size of the number that you want to factor. What does it mean? It means that, let's say I want to use uh, our supercomputer, Leonardo, or the best supercomputer in the world to factor a number who has uh, 248 digits, uh, which is uh, usually the size used today in uh, RSA crypto system today. And okay, let's say that I have my supercomputer, classical supercomputer. Uh, then in order to factor this huge number with 248 digits, I will need like something like billions of years. So something that. Uh, uh, that is on the order of the uh, age of the universe, okay? Even with the, the most powerful uh, supercomputer. So what if instead um, I use the short algorithm? So let's say that I have a quantum computer, uh, which is uh, uh, for tolerance, so which uh, doesn't have too much errors, and is large enough to be able to, to solve, uh, to, to, to run short algorithm on, on this uh, digit, then the number of operation that this uh, quantum computer would need are just polynomial, not expo no more exponential. So this means that, I mean, uh, uh, assuming that um, we have this kind of device and it works with, uh, 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 and applies operations at a speed uh, which is a reasonable one, then we will be able to to uh, to factor this number in in seconds. Okay, and yeah, okay, of course. But if you want to do this on a 2048 digit number, uh, then it's it's gonna be uh, billions of years for sure. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this was like a huge result back in 1994. Okay, so uh, people said, okay, now uh, uh, with the short algorithm, uh, so if uh, we are, so with short algorithm, quantum computer will be able to, to break our uh, uh, security. So 
uh, let's say it was probably one of the first, uh, no, uh, one of the few cases where uh, we had the algorithm and we know uh, the algorithm was good without having actually the, the real, the physical device able to implement this, this, uh, this kind of algorithm. So, but after uh, the um, short algorithm, uh, so there were, so this uh, fostered the development of, of the of the field of the quantum computing field because of this huge potential of uh, in in uh, in application like this. Okay. So, uh, okay, here, okay, you uh, on YouTube there is also this uh, this very nice uh, explanation. So the story of Shor algorithm, uh, uh, straight from the source, straight from Peter Shor. So this is like the uh, IBM uh, channel on YouTube. So IBM has like a quantum software, which is called Qiskit. And on the Qiskit channel, you can find that this, this one. So, and I mean, uh, before him, before Shor uh, came, uh, came with, with this algorithm, there were other quantum algorithms, uh, like probably, the Jose algorithm or Simon algorithm, which were um, using quantum parallelism uh, or also quantum Freitas form, but um, they didn't have like a real real world application. They were uh, solving like mathematical uh, problems, which were more or less useless. Okay, so the, sure was the first one to connect the dots and say, okay, we can use this uh, new way of computing to solve something really, really interesting, like uh, breaking, uh, like factorization, okay? And the way he does was, was uh, genius because, I mean, he uh, basically um, formulated the problem of factorization and he saw the problem as a problem of finding the period of a function. Stuff. Okay, and, and uh, by looking at the problem in this way, he was able to exploit uh, results from other people, okay, from uh, uh, that already got results in, in, uh, in quantum computing using, okay, this, this other algorithm, and mainly, okay, the, the quantum Freitas form part. And yeah, this this the, the very nice story about about him how he came up with uh, with this uh, great idea. So uh, a few years after Shore, I guess nineteen ninety six, two years later, so this guy uh, Grover came up with another algorithm, which is uh, Grover Search. So Grover Search is a search algorithm. So and uh, can be applied to any problem where you don't have like information about the problem. And the only smart thing that you could do is just brute force to find the solutions. So, and for a problem where all you can do is brute force, then Grover gives a quadratic speed up. So it's still exponential, but a little bit less. So it's a quadratic speed up. Okay, it's, in, it's another quantum algorithm. And these two algorithms were like, uh, in the uh, very important algorithm for, for, for quantum computing and okay, started the whole uh, computing field, quantum computing, uh, let's say, uh, not started, but gave a huge boost to, to, to quantum computing research. Okay, so maybe uh, now uh, we're going towards okay, some, some direction where we need to classify okay, uh, problems and um, in order to, to understand which, which kind of problems can be solved on a quantum computer faster than uh, uh, a, a, with, 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 a, with a classical computer. So probably some of you know this. So there is a part of uh, computer science that studies, uh, they classify problems depending on how complex it is to, to solve them. And we have, uh, so this, this complexity, complexity theory, and we, uh, okay, we can have like problems that belong to the P class, which, where P stands for polynomial. And these are problems that are solved polynomially uh, with a classical computer. So, which means that you can find the solution efficiently. Then we have a non deterministic polynomial and P class. 
So problems which uh, definitely don't have a, an efficient uh, solution, so cannot be found in, in polynomial time, the solution, but whose solution can be verified efficiently. And then the classical example is the factorization, okay? because of course, uh, so you it's hard to factor a number, but if you're given the two primes, it's easy to check if uh, they are a solution because they just multiply them. So. And then we have n complete np complete class uh, class yeah which are the hardest problem in 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 np and here yeah of course i'm assuming uh, uh something that is believed that is uh, p is different from np otherwise we don't need uh, wouldn't need quantum quantum computation at all okay so of course i mean uh, whatever is in P, so whatever uh, problem admits a classical efficient solution, also meet a class a, um, uh, efficient quantum solution. Okay, so everything that you can do with the classical computation, you can also do with quantum computation. We have seen that factorization, uh, which uh, belongs to the MP class, so it's not in, in P. It's in NP. So the short factorization, the factorization algorithm uh, is something that it's hard for a classical computer, but it's easy for a quantum computer. So that's why it's uh, in pink or in red. And then we have then we have Grover search. So search problems in general are very hard. So uh, require exponential time for classical computation. But uh, okay, maybe the color is okay, and can also be solved um, by quantum computation. Why with uh, quantum computation? What with, with a little speed up, just a quadratic speed up. So maybe we can identify a new set of problems which are efficiently solved by a quantum computer, which we called BQP, which stands for bounded quantum polynomial time. Okay. Um, so, and of course, factorization uh, is in this uh, in this set. Unfortunately, grow, uh, search problem is not in this set because it's still uh, exponential, even though uh, we have uh, some quadratic speed up. So, what else is inside this BQP? Inside the, the set of problems that could be efficiently solved by quantum computers, we have quantum system simulations. Okay. So, this was basically the original let's say idea of uh, Richard Feynman which um, so he, his idea was okay pretty simple but uh, uh, I mean it was a very interesting idea which was uh, why don't we use uh, a quantum system so a quantum computer which is at the end a quantum system to simulate nature so which is another quantum system okay very simple but powerful idea and actually, okay, for what concerns the application, okay, we have, we know, uh, we have seen that short algorithm with an exponential speed up can be applied to, um, to cryptography, for example, optimization. Uh, so Grover algorithm, Grover is a search problem, can be applied in optimization, database search, for example. And then we have chemistry, so quantum simulation part, which also have an exponential speed up with respect to the classical case. These are like old school quantum algorithms because like, they were developed like in the 90s and early year 2000. So uh, these are great algorithms because we know uh, they have the, uh, uh, we, we have some uh, proof, mathematical proof of their speed up. Uh, but, so there is a, a, a but, which is uh, this algorithm assume to have ideal qubits. So uh, consider like they're good on pen and paper. Uh, so we have the proof of their performance, of their, of their number of operation, uh, which uh, implies some speed up with respect to, to the classical case. But of course, I mean, these are uh, um, uh, considered like, do not consider the specification of, of the art, of course, because in the 90s, there were no 
quantum hardware to, to, to test. Okay. So this considers actually ideal qubits, which are not subjected to noise or errors. But actually, if you want to implement, uh, to, to build a quantum computer, and you want to run this kind of algorithm, then you're going to encounter a lot of errors. Because quantum mechanics, at, uh, at the end, uh, I mean, it's very fragile. So the quantumness of a system can uh, be easily broken. Okay? And there are several sources of errors. Okay? So for example, um, Create quantum errors where uh, you apply, for example, one gate. So you want to apply some gate, let's say Hadamard gate, but actually you uh, are not uh, complete control on what you're doing, and you're not doing like the exact Hadamard gate. You're doing something slightly different. So at the end, at the end, the gate is not correctly applied. For example, the coherence, which is one of the main source of errors. So degrees means uh, losing uh, the quantumness of the system due to interaction with the environment, okay? And quantum systems are very uh, sensible to these things. So easily they get uh, uh, easy coupled with the environment, they lose their quantumness and you're left with some classical uh, system, okay? And that's something that you don't want in quantum computing. You want uh, the quantumness of the system to stay as long as possible. Initialization error, so you fail to prepare the initial state, for example. On in some cases, you can also uh, lose some qubits. Okay, uh, this is something that uh, doesn't happen in the classical case, but okay. uh, may happen in the quantum case that you start with ten qubits at the end you have uh, eight of them. Okay, with some probability, this also could happen. So. Uh, but okay, people are smart, and I mean, sure was one one of them, uh, one of the people that first uh, uh, realized this thing. So you can also create uh, algorithms for quantum error correction. So uh, no matter uh, which kind of error you have, you can uh, correct them on the fly. Let's say. So usually this algorithm, this quantum error correction algorithm require ancillary qubits. So you add multiple qubits, you add the redundancy. And uh, this um, uh, error, quantum error correction algorithm are uh, able to detect the noise. So detect the, the error that has occurred and also decode the error and correct the error. Okay. So these are great, but the best, the, the best things about, about uh, quantum error correction is that you need a lot of ancillary qubits. So you need to add a lot of redundancy. So error correction, so usually requires computer with about 1 million or 10,000 of qubits, hundreds of thousands of qubits. So uh, you need a computer of this size in order to run this kind of algorithm for which uh, you know the, the the speed up, so for which you have this uh, provable speed up, and uh, so error correction comes with this overhead in the number of physical qubits that you need. So usually, uh, so the ratio is more like in order to create a single logical ideal quantum qubit, you need more or less something like a thousand physical qubits. This kind of devices of fault tolerant, so error corrected uh, quantum computer are gonna be available in probably not 10 years, probably 20 years, okay? 20, 30 years. So nobody really knows when, okay? And right now, so the largest device has 100 qubits. So we're very far from, from this uh, error correct, uh, fault tolerant regime where we can run this kind of uh, huge uh, quantum algorithm for which we know the, the, the speed. Up. So, uh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, the, the ratio is, is very, um, it's one to, to, to a thousand, okay, more or less. Okay, so we have now uh, this question, which uh, is a relevant question at this point. So, it's how can we use the small and imperfect quantum devices 
uh, also called NISC devices that we have today. So uh, we have several kinds of devices that differ uh, for two main things. So the main difference is in the uh, technology used to fabricate the qubits. And uh, the second difference concern uh, which kind of algorithm, which kind of application this uh, quantum system can, can run. And yeah, right now, yeah, of course, we're living in this uh, era, which is called the NISC, uh, NISC era. And NISC stands for no, the era of noisy intermediate scale quantum computation. So uh, that's the current uh, status of, uh, of quantum computing. So uh, uh, noisy, because uh, uh, of course there is no error correction. So there's gonna be noise, there's gonna, there's gonna be errors and you cannot do anything ab about, about that. You can try to, uh, in the best case, you can try to mitigate errors as much as possible. And intermediate scale, so we don't have like large scale photorial quantum computers. So we don't have like million or thousands of qubits. We have a few hundreds of them. Okay. And uh, uh, so that's why it's intermediate scale. And we also have different qubit technologies, which are so. Uh, the, their properties and so the technologies are very different one one another. Uh, for example, superconducting technology, so which is based on so where uh, basically there are they they are let's say macroscopic chip microscopic with respect to to atoms, for example, uh, which are cooled down to very low temperature uh, in such a way that the circuit. Um, uh, so show some, some superconductivity effect. And basically in superconducting devices, the current can circulate in both, uh, in both directions. And that's basically your, your, your qubit, okay? Uh, neutral atoms. So in neutral atoms, uh, you can control individual atoms with lasers and to electronic state of the levels of, of the, of the atom are your your qubit your qubit states, then trapped ions uh, something similar, but this time you need to trap ions in a different way, and then photonic, so with with light and and uh, wave guides, okay, where okay here the carrier or the quantum information will be several different things in uh, photonics, but will be something like um, polarization, okay, stuff like that. So let's now, ah, okay. And what are the differences? So uh, there are good things and bad things about each one of them, but the main, uh, so these four main approaches. So there are also other, other approaches to, to build uh, qubits, but these are the, the most uh, relevant ones probably. And um, the main differences concern uh, the topology. So how qubits are connected together, how uh, they can, how uh, in, they interact. Then coherence time. So, which means the uh, lifetime of the quantum superposition. So uh, uh, the life, the uh, time uh, um, it takes for, for the quantum computer to lose uh, uh, its, uh, its quantumness. Gate delay, so uh, the time needed to apply a single gate operation. And then the fidelity. Fidelity means the fi fidelity in gate operation or um, how good is, uh, how good, um, is your, uh, 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 how good are your gates. So basically, um, if you compare uh, the the quantum state um, after uh, a gate with uh, the gate with the, the state that you would expect, then you can measure the difference, and that's the gate fidelity. So a good fidelity uh, for for gate operation it's beyond uh, ninety nine percent. Okay, so which means ninety nine percent means that uh, the gate. Uh, 
the, the quantum state after after the gate is 99% similar to the gate to the quantum state that you would expect. Okay. So, uh, yeah. To have a full tolerant quantum computer, the idea is to escape this kind of mist, mm -hmm. or it's necessary to have a totally different technology. Um. Yeah, people, are, I think, are trying to to scale uh, these uh, these uh, these technologies uh, up to to uh, I mean as much as possible. We also have other technologies like uh, uh, topological uh, uh, related to topological quantum computation. Uh, but I mean, still, uh, yeah, of course, people are trying to to scale this uh, as much as possible. But yeah, there is no clear winner right now. So uh, maybe uh, it's one of them, maybe not, nobody knows. So could be also another a different technology that we still haven't um, considered for, for quantum, for, for tolerant, uh, the for tolerant regime. So yeah, nobody really knows. Um, but okay, let, let's see what are the pros and cons and maybe uh, you uh, can, uh, uh, can have an idea about the about the uh, which is the most promising, but I don't know. Uh, okay, superconducting devices. Uh, so we have different uh, subtypes actually: tunable, uh, parametric, flux qubits, coherence times are of the order of uh, um, a few micro microseconds, except for flux qubits which should be around uh, nanoseconds. Gate fidelity is uh, quite high, but not so, so good. So uh, 99.5 uh, on average, let's say. Gate delay, so uh, it's of the order of, uh, of uh, tens of, uh, uh, oh, no, sorry, it's of the order of, uh, yeah, yeah, mm, nanosecond or tens of nanoseconds except for flux qubit that do not allow gate operations. The best thing is that, I mean, you have to uh, make them work uh, using superconductivity, which means that you have to cool them down to very low temperatures. So the environment needed is like 200, uh, sorry, 20 millikelvin, so very close to absolute zero. The largest devices have, uh, as I told you, at most uh, 100 qubits, uh, while this, these other uh, superconducting uh, were able to reach the scale of a few thousands. Uh, the reason why is that these allow a different uh, control. So you have less control on the, on the system that you can, uh, so for example, you, can, you don't have gates, okay? But in this way, you can um, scale the system uh, more easily, okay, but uh, with the limited uh, capabilities. And these are some uh, notable uh, players. Uh, IBM is in this uh, second column, for example. Google is in the first one. And uh, we're going to talk about D Wave also, which is in the last column. So, yeah, in general, the, the pros are that they have high gate speed and fidelities, which means that. Uh, you can apply a lot of gates during the coherence time. Uh, I mean, a lot. Uh, at, at least the gates are, are, are fast. Um, and then uh, for the fabrication, you can leverage the uh, known, very known, well-known processes of uh, uh, building uh, like classical circuits and the lithographic processes. And they had a head start because the, the, um, it was like the first qubit modalities to, to, be, to be built and developed. The bad thing is that, okay, they require cryogenic cooling. They have a short coherence time, but actually what, what, what's relevant is the, the ratio between, uh, uh, between uh, gate time and coherence time. And then, uh, okay, you can also may have some uh, uh, errors due to the uh, uh, to do uh, a cross talk, let's say. 
but oh, as you see, IBM and Google, which are like the the most uh, um, so the, the biggest name in quantum, uh, went. Uh, so I've selected like this technology. Then we have ion traps, uh, ion trap technology. Uh, the coherence time here is very long; it's the order of seconds. But uh, also the gate fidelity is very high. Uh, but uh, uh, the time take the time to to apply single gate operation is quite slow. So the order of uh, of uh, so zero point zero point uh, sorry. Uh, 0 0.2 uh, milliseconds. They do not require um, low temperatures, but vacuum. And the largest device is uh, have a few tens of qubits. And here we have Honeywell, IonQ, AQT. So AQT is a uh, continuum also. Continuum is uh, UK. AQT is uh, uh, Austria, I guess. So we have extremely high gate fidelity here and long coherence time which is good no cryogenic needed and also with respect to uh, superconducting devices you know superconducting have microscopic objects so they are fabricated uh, microscopic with respect to atoms while atoms by default are uh, all identical so you have like uh, the qubits are always are all uh, similar okay, are all identical and this is not true for uh, for th this case here, because you can have defect in uh, building your your uh, your qubits, and uh, um, so I uh, yeah qubits are perfect, let's say, and consistent. We have uh, however we have slow gate times, and uh, connectivity is a little bit. Uh, um, so in general, you may have uh, all to all connectivity, but. Uh, I, you still have to um, uh, move atoms in order to to make them interact, and probably it's very so. You need an ultra high vacuum, and probably the hardest part is the laser uh, to laser control. So it's hard to start to scale the 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 system of laser that control the, the qubits, and that's why they are struggling to go beyond uh, forty qubits. Then we have uh, photonics. So uh, here we have extremely fast gates, uh, extremely fast gates. Um, no need for, so they work at room temperature, so which is great. Um, uh, okay, some, something about fidelities is still not well understood because uh, the, the bad thing about, about, fo about photonic devices is that uh, photos don't naturally interact. So to create gate are uh, challenging, a, a technological challenge. Uh, so there is no, however, the work is uh, at room temperature, so no vacuum, no cryogenic needed. Um, uh, and the main company here is Xanadu, I guess, which is a Canadian company. Uh, and they are using uh, uh, photonic devices, and they have uh, the device with uh, 216. Uh, it's not qubit; it's something similar, but uh, uh, we can say 2016 qubits. Okay, that can perform some uh, specific operation, not every kind of uh, of, of circuit. And finally, we have uh, neutral atom devices. So neutral atom devices, they have long coherence time of the order of uh, seconds. Uh, okay, no, uh, okay, hundreds of milliseconds. Gate fidelity expected not very high, so around 98%. So, uh, uh, the time for 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 needed for for uh, the application of a gate is something like uh, of the order of micro microseconds. They do not need uh, cryogenics, but they need uh, ultra high vacuum. The largest device has two hundred qubits, one hundred twenty qubits. So the main uh, companies are Qera and Pascal. Pascal is also a French startup. 
to a French company now. But I think they internally have a prototype of uh, 400 qubits, while QERA is uh, from Boston. And, uh, and yeah, they have like the 200 qubits available. So um, probably, yeah, uh, you have a strong connectivity. Uh, atoms here, again, are perfect because uh, qubits are stored. Uh, so the carrier of the quantum information is like the electronic levels of the system. So uh, qubits are all identical. Uh, and uh, yeah, but also here, laser scaling is, is quite challenging because uh, you have uh, optical tweezers, so which means lasers, and each laser controls a single atom. Okay, so and you have two hundred of them, so uh, it's, it's it's not it's not uh, uh, an easy task. Uh, okay, so uh, and this is like um, this picture here. You can see uh, is divided into um, three parts. So on on the x-axis, you have uh, the average two qubit error, uh, two qubit gate error. On the y axis, you have the number of qubits. And, and this plot is divided into three parts. So everything that is below, let's say, 40 qubits can be simulated easily with the, quant with the classical device. So Everything below 20 qubits can be easily emulated, let's say, with the, with the laptop. So you don't need a quantum computer. Everything, let's say, be, uh, below 40 qubits can be uh, perfectly emulated with a uh, supercomputer or a cluster. OK, so uh, everything that is uh, in this uh, regime here can be actually easily simulated. and. Um, for simulation, you usually have two, uh, two, two kind of softwares that you can use, state vector simulator, which, uh, uh, which are able to um, emulate, let's say, the full behavior of, of your quantum computer. And uh, yeah, with this, you cannot go beyond 40 qubits, let's say, with state vector. Then, OK, in, uh, we have the. Uh, the red part, which is the part where uh, quantum computers, which have more than 40 qubit, but, uh, but that are too noisy. So the fidelity, the two qubit uh, gate fidelity is too, is too low okay? to, be, to be relevant. So you have too noisy to, uh, to, to, be, to be useful. Okay. Of course, yeah, okay, here you see like here we have continuum. Uh, Rigetti, which is another company, IQM, IBM, Google, which are like going uh, uh, in this direction, maybe. And and yeah, okay. What you would like to have is something that is in the green zone, which means more than 40 qubits and very low error rates. Okay, and still nobody is in this. Uh, in this in this area here, actually, is even more uh, harder than that because you can uh, use uh, other uh, classical software for emulating quantum system, which are called tensor networks, uh, which are able to simulate actually, as you can see, a number of qubits which is very high, like up to thousands of qubits. Uh, but uh, with the limitation about the circuit depth, so about the uh, the depth of, of the algorithm. Okay, so tensor networks are able to 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 emulate quantum computers if the quantum entanglement that is shown in the system is not too high. Okay, so you, you not only want to stay here, you also want the entanglement to be quite high. Okay, in order to be relevant. Um, okay, so that's the current status. So, uh, of course, the full tolerant quantum regime 
goes uh, in this direction. So uh, beyond, uh, of course, a uh, uh, few hundreds of qubits. But something that uh, is not for tolerant, but in this regime here still could be uh, very interesting. So we are not there yet, but we're starting to probably converge. Okay. And hopefully in the next uh, uh, five to 10 years, we're going to have something that uh, at least here that we can, we can use. So, uh, okay, very few words. Okay, we can have, um, or maybe we can, we can stop, I guess it's, uh, we can stop and resume it. Ah, okay, because there is no, okay, let's go on. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so we've seen, okay, how um, NISC computers can be differentiated depending on their, uh, on their, uh, on the qubit technology. Now let's try to, uh, divide them into different classes depending on which kind of algorithm can be run on these devices. So if you look at the, okay, the, the, the applications or, or the algorithm that uh, they can implement, you have like three kinds of, uh, of, of hardware. One is general purpose quantum computers that basically can run any algorithm, any quantum algorithm in theory. Quantum simulators, which can run a limited set of algorithm or quantum algorithm. And then we have quantum annealers, which can run only one algorithm, which is quantum annealing algorithm. Okay, let's start with the, the quantum annealing part. Uh, again, uh, quantum annealing can only run the quantum annealing algorithm. Uh, for this kind of devices being a noisy, be, uh, being a NISC, so intermediate scale means we have up to several thousands of qubits. The main company is D-Wave, which has this 5,000 qubit uh, device. They have this 5,000 qubit device. And uh, so they are able to, to scale this, uh, this device up to 5,000 qubits because of course they can do only just one thing, which is quantum annealing. And they have like, so which means that you only need a limited control on uh, your quantum system, okay? And they are not working with the gate operation, for example. And still, they are noisy devices. So, but actually, quantum annealing, I mean, this kind of device do not need uh, error correction, but it's still unclear um, how, so the noise due to um, the qubit quality, uh, how, could, how the noise could affect uh, the scalability, so the performance related to, to large problems. So, we still don't know, okay? What happens if we uh, scale this system up to uh, several uh, uh, tens uh, or, or uh, hundreds of thousands of qubits? I don't know. Okay, maybe. Uh, okay, I still don't know. So, but quant uh, these kind of devices are quantum annealers that uh, so can only run this quantum annealing algorithm. What is it? So, quantum annealing. Uh, is an algorithm that can be used for solving problems expressed as Kubo or Easing problems. So uh, Kubo stands for quantum unconstrained binary optimization problems. So basically, quantum annealing can be, can be used to solve optimization problems that are uh, can, that can be formulated, uh, expressed in this way. And actually, I mean, it seems a limitation, but actually you can cast uh, very, uh, I mean, a lot of problem in, in this form. And what's the advantage? The advantage could be that um, uh, quantum annealers uh, can use quantum tunneling and superposition in order to explore the configuration space and maybe avoid uh, uh, getting stuck in, in local minima uh, like classical methods. So as I told you, there are several real world hard problems that can be formulated as Cuba problems. So this is not a real limitation. This is like a nice paper uh, that tells you how to formulate a, some NP hard problems into Cuba form. 
And you can have, for example, a cubo formulation of machine learning, molecular dynamics, scheduling problems, which can be solved with, the, with quantum anneaters. And the main advantage probably is this one. Uh, they may have this advantage with respect to simulated annealing, where in simulated annealing, okay, when you get stuck in some local minima, uh, um, sometimes you cannot escape minima because the transition probability so you cannot explore anymore like the, uh, the, the configuration space of the optimization problem. And the transition probability uh, in simulated annealing, uh, like in this case, uh, uh, is, pro is proportional to, to this quantity here, which depends on the height of the, of the barrier that you want to overcome in order to escape this local minimum. Well, in quantum, in quantum annealing, so you, they can express the quantum tunneling effect where the transition probability not only depends on the height of the barrier, but also on the width uh, of the barrier. So if the, the minima are separated by uh, a barrier which is thin enough, that you can still have, uh, you can still escape via quantum tunneling. Then we have quantum simulators. So quantum devices, um, that um, uh, are uh, so if we can say that gate operations are like digital operations, uh, these kind of devices only admit analog processing, which means you need to change uh, uh, the Hamiltonian. So you need to uh, change like the, the Schrodinger equation associated to to the to the system in order to perform computation. And usually, um, so quantum computation is carried out at a very low level, in the sense, at a level which is very close to the hardware. So by directly manipulating the mathematical operator, the Hamiltonian that describes the, the system. And manipulation means uh, like you have to change like the intensity or frequency of the laser that is shined towards the, the system, and that interacts with the system. And you also can change the qubit to bulge. Okay, this kind of devices so uh, can implement a, a limited set of algorithms. And right now, okay, the main uh, the main uh, uh, companies are Pascal and Qera, and uh, let's say uh, that still you don't have enough qubit to perform error correction. And yeah, the interaction with the environment generates, I mean, uh, errors, okay, and limits the duration of the quantum computation. And finally, the last part uh, before the break, so the last slide. So you have, you may have general purpose quantum computers, and which, so these use gates. So in theory, they can run any kind of quantum algorithm. Uh, right now, we have up to hundreds of qubits. So with IBM with 127 qubits, Google with 70 cu 72 qubits. Uh, again, error correction. Uh, we're not in the in the regime of of quantum error correction, so we're gonna have errors, and maybe uh, error rate per single uh, two qubit gate affect the depth of the circuit, because if we have an error rate of 0 0.1, means that at most, let's say we have, uh, we can. Uh, uh, run circuit with at most uh, 100 gates, okay, which is not not too much gates, okay. So we only have a shell, so limited depth circuits. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, okay. In general, I mean, uh, these numbers here are associated with uh, uh, two qubit uh, gates, so gates that involve two qubits, okay, like like this one, unit fidelity. Okay, so um, let's say you want this to be like uh, as close as possible to 99.99%, okay? Uh, if you have this, uh, this is very high, you can perform, uh, yeah, I mean, you can run circuits which are very deep, so which involve many uh, operations, okay? And this is, but okay, this is ready to uh, gate fidelity, so the error that you get when you apply one gate. Then you have, of course, all the other errors, uh, like for example, in uh, a neutral atom device, you can have also qubit loss. So you maybe you lose some qubit because the laser that is uh, holding the qubit in position 
uh, as some, I don't know, uh, some uh, oscillation for some, some, some reason and you lose some part, okay? So there are of course some uh, things that, um, so errors are of different kind, okay? So in theory or qubit uh, that you have are useful. Some of them may have, for example, uh, some of them, for example, here may have also different coherence times. Okay, so maybe one, maybe you, uh, if you do your quantum computation of a restricted set of of, of qubits, uh, uh, by picking like the the best performing ones. Okay, you may have like uh, coherence time which which is of the order of uh, of the best numbers here, but maybe all the others are uh, have have. Uh, lower coherence so i mean uh yeah uh, it's it's a mess okay but uh yeah people i mean and you cannot control uh, errors too much you can for example reduce uh, uh noise i mean you can isolate the system as much as possible you can decrease temperature okay and these are all things that um increase your uh, your ability to maintain a quantum state and reduce errors as much as possible. So uh, yeah, of course, you have to isolate uh, the 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 system from from, from the external environment, uh, cool them down to to very low temperatures, and uh, uh, you you want to require you want to, to have system that are like uh, stable, let's say as as much as much as possible. And yeah, you could now. Uh, I mean, you cannot do error correction. You can, for example. Uh, perform error mitigation now, which is nice. Uh, error mitigation means, uh, uh, so it's like, uh, we care about uh, reducing quantum errors when we can uh, increase errors. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, it's a silly idea, but it works. Maybe um, error mitigation works because uh, people are increasing errors and uh, try, um, to estimate uh, what will be, so they're interpolating things and try to estimate what will be the result when there is no error, okay? So just they're doing this uh, 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 interpolation, okay? So that's a, a nice approach. So yeah, uh, you can, for, for example, correct, uh, um, I don't know, uh, bit flip, bit flip errors with some uh, quantum circuit, okay? Uh, that you need to add to, to your quantum computer. But of course, I mean, this may be, so for just, for example, the, uh, for only the, the um, uh, if you want to correct only the phase flip error, maybe you need just, uh, you need three qubit to, to express one logical qubit, okay? But it's just for that kind of error. So we have this three to one uh, overhead, but in general, if you want to correct all the possible errors, it's estimated uh, that the ratio is one to uh, a thousand more or less. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's for just for maybe a limited uh, set of possible uh, of all the possible errors. Yeah, and uh, after the the break, we're gonna uh, talk about so. So, so these are the, the NISC devices, the uh, devices that uh, are uh, uh, that we have right now. So let's see what are the uh, the quantum algorithm for these NISC devices, which of course are very different from the quantum algorithm for photon devices that you've seen before, like the short and Glover, Glover search. Okay. Let's go. So let's start with. Uh, so we have seen so far the NISC uh, devices, uh, their technology, their uh, the different uh, kind of uh, NISC devices that we can have, like um, general purpose devices, uh, quantum simulators, quantum annealing. So let's now focus on the so quantum annealers. We have seen that they can only uh, perform this quantum annealing uh, algorithm. So let's now focus more on the uh, algorithm that could be run by general purpose devices and quantum simulators. Mm. 
this is not work. Okay, fine. Okay. So the scientific community believes that this NISC technology could outperform traditional classical computers and HPC supercomputers for specific applications in the next uh, 10 years, let's say. It's, I mean, uh, we are pretty confident about that. So um, for a specific application, I mean, the most promising one are quantum chemistry, quantum optimization, quantum machine learning. For outperforming, it's not only about speed up, like uh, for the short algorithm or the old school quantum algorithm, but may also mean uh, better quality solutions. So maybe you don't have any speed up, but you're able to find better solutions that are outside of the uh, classical possibilities. Or maybe again, something that it's a pretty new concept, but maybe uh, could be relevant in the future, which, which are uh, maybe solutions which are of uh, uh, not as good as the classical ones, uh, you, uh, it, the, the solution takes, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the runtime is, 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 is worse than the, the classical one, but at least you, you, um, you uh, lower the, the energy consumption. Okay? That could be also another, another interesting thing. So, but now let's, let me talk to you about the quantum supremacy. So uh, quantum supremacy is like this term, which uh, tells, which means that um, it's the moment in time when we are able to, uh, to demonstrate that a pro programmable quantum device can solve a problem that no classical computer can solve in a feasible amount of time or in the same amount of time. And in 2019, Google at research, uh, sorry, researcher at Google, Quantum AI Lab, they compared the performances, the performance of their quantum computer, which is the Sycamore, called Sycamore, with 53 qubit, with the, the best classical supercomputer. And with the 53 qubits, the Sycamore uh, quantum processor was able to run a specific algorithm, which is called random quantum circuit uh, sampling, uh, in, 200, in 200 seconds. So this is specific uh, algorithm, the random quantum circuit algorithm, and uh, which was much less than the 2.5 days expected, um, estimated for uh, the most powerful supercomputer to, to perform the same, the same calculation. And it was like, that was like the greatest news uh, in 2019, and they made this nature paper. Uh, so, and actually, um, people then uh, from NASA and Google uh, use the, their, pro their program called uh, QFlex, which is one of the most efficient classical emulator for quantum systems to implement the, uh, uh, the uh, random quantum circuit algorithm on the summit supercomputer. And they were able maybe, uh, I mean, more or less to match the, the, the same, uh, the same um, performances, I guess. But the, the nice thing is that at the end, Sigma, the quantum processor, in order to do the problem, to, 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 to perform this computation, um, spend like uh, 0 0.42 kilowatt hour, while summit the amount, uh, so 21 megawatts, so something like five family, families in one year, rather. Uh, so Sigma was like a, a lamp for a few hours, okay? So, um, so in 2018, so uh, this kind of thing happened. But the the the, the best thing, let's say, uh, is that this kind of algorithm, so the random quantum circuit algorithm, is not like a useful for for any kind of real problem. So, one can say that its only purpose is uh, uh, to prove quantum supremacy itself. So, it's a little bit more. Uh, so. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, there is no real, uh, real, real use of this algorithm. It just its purpose is to prove quantum supremacy. Okay, but still, uh, we already passed this this point in time where um, quantum computer can outperform a, the best, uh, the best, uh, let's say, supercomputer for a specific task. 
okay even though this uh, even if this task was was useless so but now okay i'm gonna yeah introduce you more about the the nisc uh, algorithm and you have to know that uh, the recent the most recent uh, uh, proposal for uh, uh, quantum algorithms that are good uh, on on uh, nisc devices are actually hybrid algorithms so where a part of the algorithm runs on the QPU and another part on the CPU. And okay, let's focus more on, on the quantum computing part. So algorithm, um, NISC algorithm, a hybrid algorithm that involves parametric quantum circuits. So circuit that use gates or in general that apply parametric dependent operations. So like uh, arbitrary rotations of some angle gamma, Circuit that are uh, shallow, so no, not many. Let me not uh, many um, uh, uh, gates. Okay, limited limited depth. Okay, this is like a hundred, not not one thousand. Should be one hundred at the most. And uh, uh, this circuit are not error corrected, but uh, errors can be mitigated. Okay, so these are actually a circuit that. Uh, if you randomly initialize this parameter, they don't do anything in particular. They just ran, give a random output. Okay, so uh, then they're not like a specific structure like Shor or Grover Search. They're just doing something random, apparently. So what's the working principle? So the working principle is like the following. So the first part is to choose a parametric quantum circuit, which is also called variational ansatz. So the, the initial um, which means the initial uh, structure of your quantum circuit. So where you want to put the 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 um, uh, the gates, okay. And then the second part is to implement this uh, variational instance on the QPU. After that, you want to measure qubit in order to estimate some cost function, some loss function, let's say. And then uh, you uh, switch to a classical computer, which performs some optimization on the parameters, gamma, depending on the score of on the, the current score on the cost function. And usually this classical computer uses a classical optimization technique like a, that could be gradient based or gradient free. And then um, the classical computer uh, returns the new parameters, which uh, are used to update the the quantum uh, the quantum circuit, and this approach is repeated a number of times. So the cycle is repeated until convergence, or until we are satisfied with the, with the solution. This, of course, is an heuristic approach. Okay, so this is the the overall uh, workflow. So you start with some random initialization of the parameters of the quantum circuit. So in the initial, uh, the initial state doesn't do anything in particular, but then you um, optimize the parameters depending on some score that you want to minimize. And then you pass the updated parameters to the quantum computer. Okay, maybe this sounds uh, familiar to you because uh, it's actually the, I mean, the same thing that you do in a narrow network, okay? The same difference is that you don't have a narrow network here. You have just a quantum circuit with some parameters, okay? But the idea is exactly the same. Um, okay, and you can apply this kind of technique, this variational technique in many different areas. And the approach, the workflow is always the same. The only thing, so you can uh, apply this to quantum chemistry, quantum optimization, quantum machine learning. The, the only difference, um, so you can apply this work for in all these settings, the only difference is in uh, the answer. So in how you construct, so what's the initial, let's say, uh, are, um, what's, your, what's the choice in building uh, this, uh, uh, this circuit? So where, uh, how you uh, place the gates inside this, this quantum circuit, okay? And let's start with, with the variational quantum 
uh, again solver, which um, um, are used to um, to uh, calculate like the uh, ground uh, state energy, calculate the ground state of of quantum system, okay? and um, this approach. I mean, this is uh, an optimi uh, so this uh, this loop between classical and quantum. Uh, computation also maybe takes into account a little bit of the uh, so the classic optimization uh, can also somehow uh, uh, also takes into consideration the the fact that you are have you have a circuit which is producing some uh, output with with some errors okay and somehow like if the error is is very um, is below some threshold the classic optimization can take into account for, for, for uh, also that, that part. So that's why, uh, okay, for this kind of problem, okay, now you give it are more or less fine. So again, the idea is to find the ground state energy of molecules. Um, so the method that you do is that is the following. So you want your answer to your quantum circuit to uh, be a provisional molecular ground state. And the possible advantage is that uh, you could uh, be able to simulate complex quantum molecular wave function in polynomial time. Okay, you can use your quantum circuit as a proxy to the uh, molecular wave function, and you could have like two different types of circuit that can represent your this wave function. One is called uh, uh, the UCC, so which is chemically inspired. So the quantum circuit has, uh, but the challenge here is, is hard to implement, even though it has a, a, chemi a chemical meaning, but also you may have uh, hardware efficient answers, which uh, um, instead are easy to implement, but lack any physical meaning, okay? But okay, the task is to, is to find the ground state. Then we have QAOA, which stands for quantum approximate optimization algorithm, so of course uh, the application here are, are very wide because uh, there are um, multiple ways to uh, so problems uh, in general uh, uh, several problems could be casted as optimization problems uh, like routing scheduling also uh, problems in finance uh, okay there are tons of different applications to this and here the, the structure of the quantum uh, part is very uh, specific. So we have several layers. So each one uh, in green is a layer and each layer is made by two parts. So one part, uh, the UC part, so the, the blue one and the UB part, which is the this uh, uh, yellow gate here. And they both depend on some parameters. And here, basically, the blue part include the optimization problem that you want to solve. And the B part, uh, the, the, the yellow part, enables you to create superposition and explore the, the space of all the possible uh, uh, configurations. Okay. So you have, come a possible advantage, this uh, quantum exploration solution space. In a similar way uh, to to quantum uh, um, annealing, as we've seen before, so it's very similar the idea. But the challenge here is to find a class of problems for which QAOA is strictly better than the best classical algorithm. Then uh, quantum machine learning. So maybe here the uh, the word. Uh, so there is some hype behind uh, this word. So quantum machine learning, we have uh, a lot of different approaches, uh, but let's say the main uh, ideas are the following. One is the quantum feature map. So if you want to apply uh, quantum machine learning to your classical data set, you have to somehow upload uh, your classical data set into the quantum computer. In order, uh, if you want to do that, you need some quantum feature map, so quantum encoding into the quantum state. So uh, that maps your classical vector into a quantum state. 
And then you can apply uh, something that is like quantum support vector machine, where the idea is, let's try to calculate some kernel for, quantum, for support vector machine in a quantum way, and then everything else is classical. And here the challenge, I mean, the, the, the advantage could be that you uh, could be able to, um, um, to, to, um, to use more complex feature maps at low computational cost. Then we have uh, quantum neural networks, okay? Which basically, okay, the, the task is, is the same, it address some supervised machine learning problem. And in the standard approach, you have something that looks like this, where the first part is the feature map. So in the first part you encode your data set in the quantum state. And then you have a variational part containing the, the weights that you want to, to learn, okay? But the difference is that you don't have a classic neural network here. You have a quantum neural network, so you don't have a, a classical correlation, but you want to exploit quantum correlation, quantum entanglement to learn uh, things. So okay, and people have started uh, studying this thing. So I started uh, studying so how quantum neural network could be more power. So if a quantum neural network could be more powerful than quantum neural networks. And there are a few theoretical papers. Uh, this is one, uh, which shows that uh, where they, they had a look at the, the feature information associated with the classical and quantum neural network. And they've seen that quantum neural network have a, a more evenly spread uh, eigenvalues of this feature information. And this leads to better generalization. So how accurately the algorithm uh, is able to predict outcome values for uh, previously unseen data, okay? So they could have better generalization in some cases, but still people didn't test for, I mean, like huge data sets, of course, because, uh, um, because um, the feature map also uh, is, is a problem because it's hard to, to, to encode into a quantum state a, that's it, which is highly dimensional. So probably this state, this, uh, this is valid for like the Iris data set, okay? So with, with just two features. But still, okay, we, uh, we are at this point, okay? So this is the state of the art. So we, uh, people uh, uh, didn't yet explore, okay, anything uh, more, than, more than that. And also, uh, there are some problems related to vanishing gradient. So if you want to train your quantum neural network, you may uh, um, have something that is called barren plateau, which means vanishing uh, uh, gradient of the loss function, which makes hard to train. So basically, uh, if you're familiar with neural network, if you have a gradient which is zero, you don't know in which direction to update your to go and, in which, and how to update your parameters, so you're stuck. And this kind of concept like barium plateau may arise when, when you have, for example, global measurement or circuits that are too deep or too noisy or too much entanglement. So like, in uh, uh, many different uh, uh, cases. And there are also for quantum neural networks several uh, approaches like re-uploading quantum neural network, which have some properties of being able to uh, so they are able to reproduce something that um, also you have in uh, deep learning, which is universal function approximators. Convolution neural networks, which have this very nice structure, and um, they're mathematically, um, so there is the proof that they uh, do not show these vanishing gradients. And then something a little bit more exotic, like dissipative quantum neural network, which also allows some back propagation like training. So yeah, um, and that's basically, yeah, the billion dollar question that everybody has now. So are gonna be, uh, are we gonna have like quantum advantage in some uh, specific application uh, in the NIST care? So in the next uh, five to 10 years? Okay, nobody really knows. And we are working to, to, to answer this question. And yeah, as I told you, the most promising probably is uh, quantum, chem quantum chemistry because uh, it's the only, I mean, while quantum machine, while, uh, yeah, quantum machine learning, quantum 
optimization, okay? you, you deal with classical data at the end, uh, while in uh, quantum chemistry, what you want is to simulate uh, uh, quantum, um, let's say, simulate quantumly something that you already know it's quantum. Okay, so probably that's that's the most promising one. So okay, but um, let's have like a brief um, table about the hardware require resource requirement. So let's say let's uh, okay, these were estimates uh, estimated like at the beginning of the NISC era a few years ago. But probably now, okay, realistic estimation tells us that the qubit number, so the number of qubits that you will need to, to uh, for practical quantum advantage using NIST devices could be something that in the range of 100 to 2,000 qubits. For what concerns the circuit depth, so the number of gates is going to be something like definitely higher than hundreds, uh, than 100 of, of gates. <laughs> And this, uh, so, uh, um, uh, okay, the, uh, the fidelity uh, has to be like, like uh, very high fidelity in the range. Uh, okay, this is still true, 99.9% probably. And yeah, okay, current hardware are, are not like in this, uh, in this, uh, in this scenario. So we're gonna wait and hope that uh, uh, experiment, experimentalists are uh, going to be able to to create devices with the uh, high fee, with with the high gate fidelity, uh, which can scale pretty well. So that's part. Uh, so what about quantum software? So there are a lot of startups, uh, and a lot of there is a lot of open source software. These are like the main uh, the main. Uh, software that, that you have. Keyskit is developed by IBM. And so open source the software for uh, uh, developing the quantum circuit or quantum algorithm, same thing with Circ. And uh, Penny Lane is good for maybe quantum machine learning, TensorFlow quantum, so TensorFlow as its quantum um, extension, strawberry fields for photonics, AWS. So you can, AWS, in AWS, you can find some quantum computers that you can test, and you can test them via Amazon Bracket. The Wave has its own software for quantum annealing, the Wave Ocean, and Pascal uh, also has uh, Pulsar, which uh, is for, uh, it's for uh, natural atom technology, for uh, computing with natural atom technology. Okay, of course, the, the quantum stack the full quantum stack looks like this. So we have different layers. So application, uh, algorithm, framework, architecture, and so on. So uh, the, the pioneers are, as I told you, uh, IBM with, uh, with Qiskit and D-Wave with, uh, with its, its software Ocean and, and Leap. And here, um, so the architecture, I mean, the, at the end, the quantum circuits uh, in gate model. Uh, uh, so, um, okay, Qiskit is, uh, um, enables you to, um, uh, to create algorithms uh, which are in this uh, model, the gate model, so via, via gates. And their architecture, let's say their their way of storing uh, is via this open CASM, uh, uh, open CASM uh, mm. format. Well, we have LEAP, uh, the wave LEAP, and uh, the wave Ocean that allows you to construct uh, cube problems that you can solve. Uh, so optimization problem that you can solve by sending this to the D wave uh, sampler, which could be quant uh, this uh, quantum sampler or classical samplers. And then we have all the others. So Google, uh, one Rigetti is another company uh, which is uh, building uh, superconducting devices, which are, uh, has Forest. Uh, Forest is the is the um, the um, uh, it's the 
the software developed by Rigetti, Xanadu, we've seen they have both Python and Penny Lane, uh, but sorry, Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields. And uh, yeah, also the others, Pascal with Pulsar. Then, okay, in the last years, we have this quantum platform as a service uh, coming. So Amazon, Google, uh, and so mainly Amazon and, and Microsoft, Azure, uh, they allow you to access via cloud their uh, quantum resources. And they have like access to, so for example, if you go to Amazon bracket, Amazon yeah, web service, you see that you could have access to Rigetti, IonQ, or QR device via Microsoft, also uh, these other devices, quantum devices via IBM, the IBM devices, via Google, the Google devices, but maybe Google uh, is in the early access problem, so program, so it's not, it's not open right now. Uh, but of course, uh, I mean, either you are in the IBM network uh, or in, uh, or you pay uh, Amazon and, and Microsoft for uh, every night for access to to the to their machines. So uh, this is correlated to the next topic, which is the project and funding. So uh, uh, since you are connected, uh, most of you, I guess, are connected with the research centers or universities in Europe, you uh, definitely have the opportunity to um, test this kind of devices. Um, in uh, different ways by contacting people that uh, are working um, on projects, several projects at the European level that we're going to see. Okay, let's start with, with this part, this last part. Okay, at first, let me give you like a brief uh, overview of the current status. So in 2015, there were like very few quantum companies worldwide so it's the blue number so nine in europe uh 15 in the us five in canada now we have like 53 in europe quantum startups 19 in uk 59 in us 23 in uh, canada so uh, everything is growing is growing a lot and okay from 2010, 2019, there were 440 million spent on, on uh, from venture capital and so on for uh, startups. So there is a huge uh, boost because in the last, uh, from 20 to 21, so this was the, the amount of million spent, okay? And then you see this exponential uh, uh, in, uh, scaling of the, of the venture capital. So, but okay. Also, for in general, for uh, public investment, or we're concerned quantum technologies in general, not only quantum computing, also quantum sensing, uh, quantum communication, and stuff like that. So, the uh, worldwide, the effort is going to be thirty billion, and the Europe has a huge uh, part in it, and uh, we're going to see here. So, uh, yeah, of course. China uh, has, has like 50, has, so it's going to spend 15 billion, European Union uh, 7.2, and uh, the main contributors are uh, Germany and, and France. Uh, okay, so, but everything started like in 2016 with the Quantum Manifesto, which, uh, say that so we like uh, uh, with, with the with the quantum manifesto we wanted to say to the European Commission that we have the opportunity to compete for a new kind of uh, technological independence and in 2018 um, the European Commission launched the quantum flagship program which is 1.3 billion euros uh, to support 10 years of quantum of development of quantum technologies and research and then we have like other uh, entities like EuroHPC and uh, the European Processor Initiative that are also involved right now in the in several quantum computing projects because the idea is to add 
so to see quantum computing as part of uh, high performance computing and integrate quantum computing with the, with the existing HPC technologies. So we have uh, the European High Performance Computing Joint Undertaking uh, um, and uh, the Pro European Processor Initiative, uh, which works, uh, whose project aims at designing and implementing a roadmap for this new uh, family of uh, European processors. And uh, there is, I mean, the hugest uh, project right now is called HPC QS, which involves a lot of uh, so many different partners, uh, including Chinec, of course, and all the people that, that you see here, Ulit, Fraunhofer, and so on, uh, Partech, uh, Ethos, okay, and yeah, here uh, HP. HPC QS is a consortium which was born with the idea of combining HPC with quantum computing. And the idea is to, the ultimate goal is to basically to create a network of quantum computers connected uh, to uh, the main high performance computers uh, in, in Europe. And for the quantum uh, com uh, computer, so for this project, the the French company Pascal was selected as quantum uh, provi as provider for the quantum uh, for the quantum part, so the neutral atom technology. So the idea is to uh, exploit the modular supercomputing architecture and integrate the quantum processing unit as as a module and uh, enable like low latency connection. Uh, with uh, modules uh, within the network and also develop and integrate the quantum part uh, developing so this scheduling and research management uh, which uh, need to be uh, rephrased in order to take into consideration quantum the quantum part and all the hybrid quantum algorithm okay that we uh, that are now very, very popular that we've seen before. So again, this is the, uh, the, uh, the HPC US uh, um, in Europe. You see some uh, members and um, in here you have uh, ULIC uh, and uh, GNC, which are uh, candidate um, uh, RHPC sites which are going to install uh, the quantum computer. And these are all the partners, OK? And I mean, if you work for one of them, and uh, or you, I mean, there is one and one organization for, for each European country, more or less. So if you want to enter uh, with the quantum computer and you want to have access to this kind of devices, so please contact your, uh, your I mean, the the high performance computing center or uh, HPC US people, okay, so that can provide you with with the access to this kind of device and also other, because of course there are other national initiatives uh, like we have uh, in Italy, okay, for example in Italy for uh, 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 for uh, Italian uh, researchers we give access, for example, to the Wave. And Pascal, okay, via different projects, which is not HPC US, but this is true also for all the other uh, HPC centers, of course. Um, um, and in future, I mean, probably we will extend to uh, IBM also. So uh, the last thing uh, is uh, so there, there was a new tender uh, last year for the selection of seat. Of six hosting sites, uh, of six, let's say, HPC center that uh, who lost uh, uh, um, six European quantum computer, so six Euro HPC quantum computers, and at the end, so um, several applied for the standard, and these are the the uh, the countries that that won and that are going to host and operate. Uh, a quantum computer. So basically the idea is to differentiate as much as possible the technology. So 
each one of them is basically uh, is basically um, uh, hosting a different technology. So we have seen all the different technologies that we have today, and okay, we try to uh, to spread as much as possible and try to uh, to take all the different all the different uh, paths. Okay, for concerning the, the technology. Okay, and of course, Chinega and us we're gonna we're gonna host one one of them as well as all the other HPC center in this in these in these countries. So yeah, quantum is coming. Okay, that's that was like the, the last question. I hope you don't feel like this this guy at some at, at this point. And I guess um, I'm I'm on time. And uh, yeah, okay, then that's it. So thank you. Uh, uh, if you need anything, if you want to talk more about this or or uh, learn or uh, something more uh, about about quantum computing or about the different projects uh, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me and if you are also uh, enrolled in some european uh, in some italian university we can also offer some internship in the quantum computing lab and uh, yeah that's it thanks gabriele for the introduction and also for uh, inviting me uh to present today. Uh, it's not the first time actually, because uh, we at ISA, we've been uh, sponsoring uh, this summer school also in the previous edition. So, and we are very happy to do that. Um, why? Because actually there is uh, something that is currently changing in this observation, uh, which is like a convergence of all the data that can be captured as a satellite and compute means, because to process this data, we need compute means, and also new types of AI, artificial intelligence, which require actually big computing means. So I'm very happy that uh, this summer school uh, on highly disruptive computing uh, brought uh, by the IEEE GRSS Society exists because by participating to it, actually, you are training yourself to become the, the players, the actors of, uh, of the future of the observation. So I can only be very happy about that. So today, what, uh, what I will present is actually all the activities that we are uh, carrying out at uh, ISA Philab, uh, which is uh, part of the Earth Observation Program of, uh, of ISA, located in Frascati in Italy. Uh, everything we are doing to bring quantum computing to Earth observation. So first, I mean, everyone heard about quantum computing, especially if you're here, but even, I mean, people, your friends, your family, they know about it because quantum computing is everywhere. It made uh, recently the cover of Time magazine. You have all these uh, government chiefs and presidents going uh, in uh, quantum events to, to show how, uh, how, how they, they are taking uh, this as an important matter. Uh, there are lots of programs and uh, lots of announcements also in the, in the press about that. Uh, and maybe you have a question, maybe this is just some hype, maybe this is just some kind of uh, speculative bubble that will just explode. So maybe, maybe we, we don't know, but actually one thing that is maybe a bit more promising is that also the, the big tech companies are also promising us to, uh, to, to deliver actually quantum computers and uh, actually not uh, not so long ago uh, from, from now. For instance, here you have the roadmap of Google AI Quantum. Um, what they propose to do uh, since now we are uh, maybe in the, the noisy uh, period of quantum computers, that is, you can have quantum devices, but they are noisy and it's very difficult to scale up because the more you scale up, the more noise you have. Google, for instance, is promising by the end of the decade, some kind of error corrected quantum computer. So something that is also, for instance, uh, the message of IBM, uh, again, by the end of the decade, they expect to have what is called fault tolerant quantum computers. 
And this is a very interesting promise because it means that all the software, all the applications, algorithms which are developed now in the next decade after 2030, they could run on devices uh, which will have logical qubits. Uh, and so this is the reason why it is already the time to develop the applications for quantum computing. Okay. So this is all this, uh, this, this picture of uh, the, the current uh, progress of the, the current ecosystem that uh, triggered us at ESA uh, in order to, to try to, to, to explore also quantum computing for something that is very particular, Earth observation. And so for doing this, actually, um, we, we have several, several tools uh, at our disposal. Um, and basically in this talk, I will uh, try to explain a bit what are the, the kind of uh, activities we are doing uh, on how actually they are uh, feeding each one to, to, to the other one. Uh, we try to, to define our own roadmap. So how can we bring quantum computing to our observation? And actually this is not uh, something uh, obvious because uh, you may know or you might not know also that of course quantum computing uh, seems very promising when you are dealing with quantum processes. So for instance, if you are doing something that is, uh, I mean, related to quantum physics or uh, for, for dealing with uh, objects which are some kind of quantum properties, it sounds very uh, likely that quantum computer could be a very good fit. And this is why maybe in quantum chemistry, for instance, there are lots of research going on actually. Um, and uh, because, I mean, you have this connection between the data and the kind of algorithms you can run. With Earth, with Earth observation, it's not exactly the case. The, there is some kind of quantum sensing uh, from, uh, from satellites, but it's mostly used for uh, the study of gravimetry. And actually, this is something that ISA is also exploring. Uh, we, we plan to have missions uh, uh, not launched yet, but uh, soon to explore this kind of stuff. So you will have quantum sensor in space to study the gravimetry. I will not discuss that today. And uh, what I have in mind actually is more the, let's say the usual business of Earth observation. So maybe some, some kind of data you are dealing with also yourself, um, which are images, data cubes from Sentinel-1, radar, Sentinel-2, optical data, uh, maybe hyperspectral data, uh, like uh, the, the, the PRISMA or uh, NMAP missions, and maybe uh, also soon the PACE mission from NASA. Uh, PRISMA is from the Italian agency and NMAP from uh, the German uh, space agency. So th there is lots of data cubes which are coming and uh, of course, this will require some new ways to, uh, to deal with. Uh, but the issue is that those are non-quantum data. So a big question we have is how to leverage quantum computing to deal with this kind of uh, non-quantum data, classical data, on in which, kind, which part of the processes we have uh, can, we, uh, can we find some, some advantage. So, Defining a roadmap is the main objective. The second objective is to already start to explore something. And so I will, uh, this is done usually by uh, co-funded research with uh, various partners in Europe. So I, I will also uh, enlighten you, I hope, with uh, the results of this, uh, this research. And last of it, but not least, we are also building a network uh, trying to bring together players from the Earth observation community, from the GRS community, with players from the quantum computing uh, ecosystem. But let's start with the roadmap de uh, definition. On how do we do that? Uh, very easily, because we are uh, a funding agency, uh, among other uh, mandates. 
so what we did is last year, we, we issued a call for projects uh, with those objectives. And uh, so basically what we, we need to do is to, to identify use cases uh, relevant to our observation. So basically our, uh, what we, in everything that we are doing from um, early data processing, mission preparation, data processing, maybe also some kind of, uh, of uh, uh, feature extraction and information extraction. Uh, find use cases where quantum computing could be uh, something useful. That is, um, more than useful, maybe, uh, where quantum computing could help and solve problems which were untractable before. So this is, of course, very important because uh, quantum team might not be useful for everything, but for specific topics, for specific tasks, it might uh, become the, the main paradigm in uh, 10 or 20 years from now. Then, of course, quantum computing is uh, a rapidly evolving field. And also what we wanted to, to have is a kind of assessment of all the, the quantum uh, architectures which are existing from uh, gate-based computing to ion trap to uh, photonics. Uh, even uh, annealing also. So there are lots of machines and lots of uh, companies uh, trying to push them. That's uh, their job. But we wanted to have a kind of, uh, of picture of this uh, also vibrant uh, ecosystem to be able also to, to assess maybe which machine is the best fit for some use case. Because maybe you have some kind of quantum device that is very good for optimization. And in that case, maybe it's good for the association use case, which require very good optimization. Then, of course, everything we, I mean, those are the machines. So let's say, again, technology. But of course, there are providers of these technologies. And also having this picture of the, the industry of, uh, and also the a kind of timeline of, uh, of their progress to know when this will be available is of course very interesting for us. Following this, uh, this call, uh, we had uh, two projects which were uh, awarded. Uh, I'm very happy with uh, actually the, also the, the teams which are composing each of the project because we have really people from all over Europe, so this is really a European effort uh, to bring to ESA uh, the knowledge about that. Uh, in the first project, which is led by DLR in Germany, but uh, with uh, uh, lots of partners in uh, Finland first, in VTT and the CSC, which is uh, the Finnish Supercomputer Center, and uh, lots of uh, Polish uh, universities or uh, research centers. Uh, they launched the quantum advantage for your project. So the objectives are the one I just uh, I just mentioned. And there's this approach of trying to identify use cases, uh, finding the right architecture, also looking a bit at the uh, hybridization with classical supercomputing and analyze the, the timeline to which uh, this kind of process could become interesting. Um, if we go a bit more in the details of the use cases they are investigating, you can see actually here uh, quite uh, interesting um, use cases, uh, which are maybe uh, the future for uh, supercomputum, uh, sorry, supercomputing slash quantum computing. Uh, for instance, digital twin of the Earth. This is also uh, something that is. Uh, very important in the European ecosystem now. ISA is uh, trying to build with uh, partners, UMETSAT and ECMWF, this kind of digital twins of the earth. So what would that be? Some kind of um, big model where you have actually lots of physical models, lots of data, and you are able to run some kind of monitoring uh, studies, forecast studies, also to play what-if scenarios. So 
for instance, to be able to, to know if uh, given the current state of uh, the Earth's climate variables, tomorrow there will be some sea rise somewhere, uh, more wildfires in some place, and so on. And this, of course, it requires huge computing means. Uh, so, of course, supercomputer, high performance computing, and maybe for some tasks, quantum computing, which could act as a, an accelerator to some process to mix the physical models on the AI, on the data. Other thing is, of course, hyperspectral imagery, because uh, here you have huge data cubes. So at some point, processing and just manipulating them is very difficult. And you see some advantages, maybe, of uh, quantum uh, algorithms is the capacity to quantify uncertainty. We have a second study uh, with a quite similar name, quantum computing for observation. Here, maybe the focus is more on also on the um, on the computing part. So also the hybridization uh, between supercomputing and quantum computing. And this is a, a study led by uh, Fortune Centrum uh, Julish, uh, people that you should meet uh, in this summer school. Uh, with uh, a consortium that is uh, bringing uh, also around the table Thales Ania Space, so the industry uh, in France and Italy, ENFN, which is an institute, a research institute in Italy, on IQM, IQM, which is one of the, the main European manufacturers of quantum devices. So this is very interesting here to see that we have between these two consortia, uh, research centers, universities, because they are pushing the research, supercomputer centers, and also the, some newcomers in the Earth observation field, which are the quantum uh, device producer, which maybe uh, will lead the, the market of computing in uh, 20 years from now. With uh, this consortium, actually, we have we are also exploring some kind of, uh, of scenarios to, to, to identify the, the most promising use cases. And you see here lots of uh, things from time series classification, also mission planning, likely, and uh, also the, the SAR formation. So, so SAR data compression, SAR on, on polarimetric, uh, uh, sorry, uh, interferometric SAR on the overlapping problems. So a lot of scenarios which are now studied on hopefully, this is a, sorry, this is a, the, the good thing in those studies is that uh, they will deliver some reports and before the end of the year, they will be made uh, public. So everyone in uh, the GRS community uh, will have access to them. And if you want to try to explore maybe uh, quantum computing force observation, Maybe we will be able to do this uh, on the find, uh, based on the findings of those studies and so to, to go in the, the most promising direction. So this is, let's say, one, uh, one of the, the outcomes of uh, ESA actions that uh, will, I hope, uh, be benefiting towards the uh, European and even wider uh, ecosystem. And uh, so stay tuned for, for the result because uh, it is coming uh, by this summer. So early fall, we'll be able to, to deliver to you uh, these reports. Second part of, uh, of this talk, and uh, maybe less programmatic because I, I will go a bit in the details of uh, exploratory activities. By exploratory activities, I really mean some kind of uh, research, early research we are doing at a low tier um, that we actually are not so much actually doing the research that we are partnering with universities and research institutes uh, in Europe. We have a few of them here, CERN uh, in Switzerland, uh, Supercomputer Jülich in Germany, 
the Polish Academy of Science, but also Jagiellonian University in, in Poland, Università Aldo Moro uh, in Italy, uh, in Bari. And this can, can grow uh, again, actually. And we have also lots of partnerships uh, a bit everywhere. And what we are doing in this kind of, uh, of uh, partner research is that uh, we are co-supervising or co-exploring uh, research uh, topics with uh, PhD students or postdoc in every one of these uh, institutes. Here again, the idea is to, to bring together earth observation data, quantum modeling, but also quantum modeling as seen in a more generic supercomputing environment. Because again, this is, um, I hope that by repeating it, I will make it clear by the end of this talk. This is the vision we have that quantum computing for now might not be enough to, to solve everything, or maybe even in the future. Uh, but quantum computing hybridized with supercomputing might be a, a right way to go. So what have we done so far? First, uh, with my colleague Alessandro, who is uh, also online. So if we have a question in the end, uh, you will be also able to, to participate to, to answer. Uh, what we did uh, uh, like two, more than two years ago now is to try to, to build a first hybrid quantum classical convolutional neural network. So basically, some neural network, some AI network, able to process an image, but in the end, it is interfaced with some kind of quantum devices, uh, which is changing a bit the results. And this was a first proof of concept that actually you can deal with those observation images with hybrid network. And this was already a huge, uh, huge step because uh, quantum machine learning, which is a field by, by itself, is interested in many aspects, but sometimes it is a bit missing uh, the, the benchmarking on downstream applications. And this also something that we, we, we would like to, to bring forward, because of course, it's important to have theoretical proofs of, uh, of the algorithms, of uh, the approaches, for the, uh, for the quantum computing to show some kind of complexity advantage, of course. But again, uh, maybe the advantage is not only in terms of uh, complexity uh, improvement, uh, reduction, or in kind of speed up. Maybe the advantage is somewhere else. And this is where we, try, we are trying, uh, what we are trying to, to find now. So this was a proof of concept. It's possible to deal with UGO images. So just do it and try to and then try to, to explore more this. How does it work and what kind of, uh, of findings we can we make? With uh, Su Yon Chang, uh, who is a PhD student with uh, EPFL on CERN in Switzerland, uh, we tried to understand a bit better what kind of quantum circuits uh, could be um, could be the best fit for this kind of uh, of QML task. And again, here we we developed a new uh, new hybrid network. I will talk about it later, so I don't go too much details here. But also, we we studied uh, what is the difference between classical and quantum uh, devices on quantum neural network. Another area of research is, uh, which is deemed as very promising by the quantum community, is the study of quantum kernels. Uh, quantum kernels as, uh, for instance, in support of machines, which was uh, before the deep learning era, uh, the, the tool of choice for many uh, machine learning protectionists. Uh, and actually, there are, lots of uh, similarities between support vector machines and the way that uh, data are projected when you are using a quantum computer. So actually, just putting data on a quantum device is actually a similar trick to the projection in a higher dimensional space 
that was the basis of superconductor machines. And this is why we, we tried uh, to, to implement quantum superconductor machines. And here we see that, uh, I thought about that uh, earlier, there are various kind of machine architecture in quantum computing. You can have uh, gate-based quantum computing, which is uh, maybe the, the most well-known, the most advanced for the moment, also because it is uh, made very popular by IBM. But there are also uh, different approaches. One of them is uh, quantum annealing. And um, so we try to do these two uh, quantum SVMs on both and try to, to, to see which one would be, would be useful. So the first one with the Jagiellonian University in, uh, in Krakow, Poland, and with KP Labs, which is one of the new space. So they are producing a perspectral data from uh, CubeSat. We, we are running this and we try to do some kind of plot detection in the multispectral UO images with hybrid quantum SVMs. And one of the, the main findings here is that we were able to build an end-to-end -end pipeline again, trying, I mean, going from the image, segmenting it, having some kind of classification, which is uh, which is made by the uh, the quantum SVM, and results are very similar actually in terms of performances with standard SVM. So this forms a basis actually to to go further and to study how we can improve also the the quantum SVM. We did the same kind of experiment. Uh, with the uh, Forschung Centrum Jülich and the student that is uh, called uh, Hamer Delil Batic. Um, and here, in that case, it was not on gate-based quantum computers, but on the D-Wave annealer, because uh, Jülich has the first European annealer, so it was the opportunity to, to test this kind of algorithms on this kind of quantum device. And so by exploring that, we found that uh, actually, I mean, Annealer have some limitations, uh, especially the kind of the number, the size of the data you can put on it. But what is interesting is that in the method developed by uh, Amer, uh, you have something that is trained on a reduced data set, but at inference time, at inference uh, time is only increasing linearly because you are only using the, the best super vectors provided by the annealer. So, here the, we have some kind of, uh, let's say, speed up advantage in the, in the execution. And this is also a promising uh, way to, to, to move forward. The two last uh, case study I will present now um, are about uh, other approaches also trying to diversify. So various kind of uh, quantum neural network recurrent neural network. And here, this is a joint work with uh, Michal Shimasko at the University of, of Warsaw. And what Michal has uh, found is that actually the, the, some things that could be a kind of advantage is, is that it is possible to train algorithms with uh, less time than with classical counterparts. And this is very interesting because if we scale up with that, maybe for training the famous foundation models, which are also kind of buzzword of the moment, maybe we won't need one month a supercomputer on the cloud of, uh, of parallel uh, CPUs, but maybe this can be done with less data with a single quantum computing. Not tomorrow anyway, but that's another issue. And the last kind of work I wanted to present you is quantum generative AI because this also seems to be a very promising, um, very promising way uh, in quantum uh, machine learning. And again, this is Su Yun Chang who tried to, to address this problem, and she developed what is, uh, I think, uh, and I'm quite proud of being part of this project. Uh, a very efficient way to have quantum generative adjacent networks, quantum GANs, which are able to, to really process and generate uh, various kinds of images from NIST or fashion NIST, which are, let's say, uh, toy problems, but also uh, images of Earth observation, which are 
much more complex. And uh, so this is an ongoing project and very interesting. Uh, but actually, I have a few slides. I try to be quick, but to, to give you more examples on this, uh, of the work of Suyon. So here, I guess I introduced already this. How, but the main issue is how can we implement uh, quantum GANs to reproduce new images and to be able to generate new images? And of course, there are lots of challenge needs. I, I think also that I have presented them already. One real question is the possibility of quantum advantage on to define this quantum advantage. On what uh, all the process that Suyon has pursued is first to have this kind of hybrid classical quantum model and especially this kind of autoencoder that is used to go from the image space to a latent space and to have the possibility to go back in the image space. And this is a very interesting trick because when you, we, you have that, you can work on reduced vectors, reduced codes for the images. And these codes are actually uh, of the right size to be operated on quantum devices. And so first we use them for classification and actually we obtain very good results also uh, at inference. And what uh, some things that um, Sullivan did was to study the expressivity of uh, the circuits with respect to the performance. And actually, we've shown that, for example, we have this kind of rule for the various circuits we can be used, that the higher the expressivity, the better the performance will be. But if you have too much entanglement in your circuits, actually, you are reducing also the, the accuracy. So you have to define the ANSATs, the circuits you are using, with respect, by, by keeping that in mind, and actually there are some circuits which are uh, better fit for this kind of, of QNL. Uh, another work of uh, Suyon was uh, to look at um, equivalence uh, on geometric quantum uh, deep learning. And uh, actually this is, I mean, since we have reduced size of the quantum devices, it's important to make them the most efficient we can. And actually, she, she shown that it is possible to build uh, equivalent quantum network and uh, that these equivalent network actually have very good generalization property and that they are able to, to learn from uh, a much lower number of samples uh, to, do, to, to perform the task they have to, to do. Um, last but not least, here again, we go, uh, we, we use our, uh, our autoencoder for projecting the images in latent space. On here, we have this quant hybrid quantum classical GAN, which is using a quantum generator from random noise to producing fake images. We have a classical discriminator, but what we do is optimizing the quantum generator to have a quantum GAN able to produce this kind of images, all the results are here, and uh, quite uh, quite good. Actually, we are not so far behind the state of the art uh, with respect to the most advanced approaches. And we have uh, shown that, for instance, in terms of FID, uh, various metrics which are used for uh, testing generative uh, uh, AI, uh, those are better than uh, classical counterparts. So counterparts with the same number of parameters. Okay. I will go maybe a bit uh, quicker for, uh, for the end. The, the last uh, pillar of our, uh, our activities is to build a quantum computing for our observation network. Um, this network is growing. Here I have uh, just noted all the let's say the, the players in Europe with whom we had a strong relationship. Either we have a contract with them, we are partnering for some work, they visited the FILAB, for instance, or we invited them in conferences. And this is uh, growing every, every week. Uh, now, after uh, two years and a half of, uh, of studying this field, 
We have been in contact with all the major industries, all the major players in Europe, and even beyond that, actually, yeah, because Canada, as you might know or not, is also an associate member states of FISA, but also uh, in the USA with NASA or some companies. We had very good uh, discussions on these topics. We have organized events. Uh, lots of them in various places with various partners, uh, also so, uh, partnering with uh, AI society, with uh, uh, Q QML societies. Um, in, the, in September this year, we will organize a six quantum conference uh, of ISA, uh, where we have a quantum computing session. So, it will be in Matera, which is in the south of uh, Italy, beautiful uh, city. So if you have the opportunity, please uh, check for this quantum conference. Uh, our partner CERN will also organize the next edition of QTML, so the quantum machine learning conference in uh, Geneva uh, in October, November, I guess. So lots of events where we are able to, uh, where you can meet us and we are able to, to meet the, the community. We are also partnering with lots of uh, organizations. We had discussion, as I said before. You all know that, but again, we are very proud and happy to partner with this summer school. Um, actually, this is not the only one. Next week, uh, my colleague Alessandro Sebastianelli will be at uh, another quantum computing school in Italy, in Bologna, more precisely, organized by the Cineca which is uh, operating the Italian supercomputer. Uh, and again and again, we have all these kind of uh, interventions uh, everywhere. We are also uh, partnering with the Quantum Open Software Foundation. We are monitoring projects uh, in this cohort. Uh, this is, of course, related to the Open Science uh, Initiative of ISA. Uh, all the departments uh, I'm belonging to uh, is trying to make uh, science better by promoting open access to the findings, to the, um, to the papers, to the, all the reports which are made, but also uh, trying to make open access data on, of course, open source uh, software. We are. Uh, we had also, I mean, we're partnering, this is already passed, but uh, uh, there was some uh, IEEE GRSS uh, special issue in JSTARS. Um, so bringing that to, uh, to the GRS community. We have a network of visiting researchers, senior ones or visiting professors, Mia Idatku, Gabriele Cavallaro, Piotr Garwan. Uh, and especially, we have lots of visiting researchers at uh, early career stage. Um, so what is the, the idea of this? Basically, uh, people like you, PhD students, postdocs, uh, they are working on this topic, maybe either in the EO topic, on quantum computing. They want to mix both of that together, and they spend one, two, three months uh, at Philab, working on that topic, gaining all the information, then they come back uh, to uh, their university uh, and pursue this work. And for instance, Mihao Shimasko uh, was uh, the, the first visiting researcher at Philab after the, the lockdown of COVID, uh, so in uh, 2021, and uh, is working on quantum molecular network at the University of Warsaw. Um, after this day, we pursued the collaborations. He had a paper at QTML 22, and now his paper on the quantum recurrent network has just been accepted at uh, the Quantum Machine Intelligence Journal. So very successful uh, uh, partnership here again. So the message here, the next one could be you. So if you're interested, you just uh, get in touch and uh, we'll be very happy to, to welcome you to work on a common uh, shared objectives uh, and to, to define a research project together. So time to finish. Uh, 
I hope that I'm uh, still in time, but uh, Gabrielle has not uh, shorted yet, so I continue and conclude. Uh, so to summarize, uh, we have general objectives because anyway, it's, uh, I mean, quantum computing is so complex that it's very difficult to, to have uh, something very precise in mind at this early stage of the development of the, the technology. Uh, but what we try to do is first to, to bring people from quantum computing on a session together and to, to, to have uh, some intersection in the, both communities so that people know the needs, for instance, in our observation, know uh, the capabilities of quantum computing, and so they are able to match this and to, to define the, the new ideas that will uh, be uh, the, the, the research progress of tomorrow. Uh, also, uh, an objective is to create synergies because there are lots of, um, of people who had worked on AI optimization, high performance computing. So here again, quantum computing is seen as a, a way to together lots of people with varied backgrounds around the same topic. Maybe in the end, quantum computing will not be the winner, but that's not an issue. The, the, the outcome will be that people have worked together for the progress of Earth observation. And finally, of course, I mean, this is uh, the thing, even if we don't have something ready tomorrow, that's not the, the goal, but maybe in the next decade, there will be something that will be uh, very useful. And so it's good to have already an idea of the, the promises of this kind of uh, software. So this is why it's important to develop as soon as now uh, the, the algorithms and the applications for this kind of, of compute means. More practically, I guess I already covered that uh, a lot of times, uh, but finding use cases, understand the advantages, maybe this is uh, the main message. Uh, is it only faster? Is it better? And what, what means better? Uh, better accuracy for, for instance, classification on the QML, or maybe is it something that like uh, faster training or better generalization properties? So all of this is uh, the kind of um, questions we, we are wondering ourselves now. On one potential solution, hybrid computing seen as uh, the, one of the most promising passwords. So, I guess I'm done. Uh, please follow uh, our activities. Uh, we, we have a website, of course. We have uh, the ESA website, also a website for ESA. Please uh, drop us a line if you have uh, interrogations, if you want to, to know more, to discuss, to present your ideas. Uh, my email is there. Again, remember this and save the date for the ESA Quantum Technology Conference. Um, it would be a great program, I'm sure of that. And so that's it. I'm very, I hope you, you learn something from this talk. And of course, if you have questions, I will be very happy to answer them. Good afternoon. I'm Tommaso Caduoglio. I'm here with uh, my colleague, Mattia Verducci. We are from Thales Arena Space. And we'll be talking, we'll try to we'll give a, a, an introduction on the, the space sector as seen by Thales and Space. And uh, we'll try to answer the question, is space ready for the quantum leap in general? And let's see, uh, <laughs> let's see what happens. And uh, actually, uh, we'll start with an introduction of the um, uh, of the space sector and what we are actually doing as a company uh, and, and the use case, the satellite, uh, the mission and satellite we will present at the beginning will be, will be important in the second phase of the presentation where we treat quantum technologies and, and so uh, it's important to have a link between the, the satellite, the mission and the, the technologies will be that we present. So these are the six parts of the presentation. 
the part the first part is related to what we do who we are and what we do as a company actually we are Thales Allen Space that is a joint venture of uh, Thales that is an, an engineering com a French engineering company and Leonardo that is uh, the Italian engineering company we are uh, almost 8000 employee and uh, he actually, the collaboration with, between Thales and, uh, uh, and the, uh, the, between Italy and French is wider in the sense that there is the, what is called the Space Alliance, in which the French, uh, French country and Italy, and Italy made um, an agreement to have uh, uh, on the space sector building two joint ventures that, that are our, Thales Arena Space, that, that is almost working on uh, satellite system design and integration, and Telespazio that is working more on, on the uh, service and the usage of the data uh, that are produced by our, let's say, generated by our satellite. Uh, Thales Arena Space uh, work in the space sector uh, widely, uh, Speaking, uh, it actually um, has the mission to, to work in, in the space sector to, to observe uh, the Earth, uh, to, uh, to explore the, um, the solar system, and to connect people and, uh, and system, uh, some system, uh, to secure and defend the uh, controlling, monitoring the uh, and protecting so the from the space and then also to to navigate because uh, we work on navigation system uh, satellite navigation system uh, in this frame actually all the our satellite platform could be uh, found moreover everywhere in the solar system uh, we start from the um, we start from the very low Earth orbit with the contribution we had on the ISS and uh, moving on the LEO uh, orbit around 700 kilometer, we have the, the satellite for Earth observation and moving to the a bit higher on the MIO orbit, we can find all the satellite of navigation instead and uh, navigation and uh, some, something on the on communication side. And then we have all the satellites that, uh, that target the moon, Mars, and beyond. Actually, uh, me and Mattia are from Thales Arena Space, uh, Italy, specifically in Rome. Uh, in, in, in Italy, we, uh, we have... Um, we, we have expertise in satellite assembly, integration and testing. We have big uh, clean room. And uh, specifically, we uh, build satellites in the Earth observation uh, and navigation domain, where with Earth observation, we, we, we work mainly on uh, radio-based observations on synthetic aperture radar. And is that our colleague from French uh, target more the, the optical uh, earth observation side of the of the systems? And other than that, we are widely spread over Europe. We have ten. We are we have sites over ten countries. And here it is. Yeah, who we are in Italy. And specifically uh, in Italy, uh, we have the, what is called DONI, that is Domain Observation and Navigation, Italy. And our, let's say, main, we, we work like per mission and per product. Uh, those are our, like some of our main mission on which we, are, we have been working in the past. We have Cosmos SkyMed. Uh, for in, in the domain of Earth observation, we have we are we participate to the Copernicus uh, program. Uh, we have built the the full constellation of uh, of Galileo, that is the main navigation system in uh, in Europe, uh, and many many more. I mean, uh, we work.
work, I mean, on the design of the satellite uh, integration and testing of all the components and subcomponent of the of all these platforms. As I said, we work yeah by by mission, but also we build product that are uh, that can be seen as building block that could be reused in different missions. So we our product uh, span from the radar uh, payload for which we have um, uh, different uh, categories of, uh, of a radar that are then adapted on the, on the specific mission, depending on the requirements that uh, are exposed by our customer. That, uh, by the way, is 90% from uh, that is uh, European Space Agency. Uh, we have uh, product that envision uh, platforms, so satellite platform like Nimbus or Platino that are uh, platform that modular platform that can be uh, built together uh, to 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 reach the size and the spe specific requirement that uh, is needed for the kind of mission. So it's, it's something a modular platform and product on the field of navigation and IROCOM in general. So communication from the satellite to critical asset like a railway system or an airplane. These are the our product in a in a bunch. Uh, we have so we will be presenting some of some of the example the uh, mission we have been working on because uh, they are useful later on to, to find out the, the match between the technologies so, so to understand how these technologies where we will where we want to apply these technologies in detail uh, essentially this is uh, Galileo uh, it's the the main navigation system the only navigation system in in Euro Europe it's made by 24 uh, satellite over three orbital plane and it's uh, it's placed in a MIO orbit around 23,000 uh, kilometer and uh, actually uh, we we don't have of course only the space segment we have the, the, the full we have trace we are working on but also on the on the ground side ground side mission uh, on the on the mission plane and a relevant thing uh, that will be linked together with the, the second part of the presentation is that uh, most of the satellites as per uh, today's specification are uh, like passive uh, satellite or have very limited computational power on board also on the navigation uh, on Galileo for example we have to see the, the satellite just as receiving the the signal from the from the ground station and uh, broadcasting it on, on the ground and then it's all a matter of uh, clock timing and and then the, the the receiver do the the calculation to define its position but for the moment being most of the satellite plat platform are uh, dependent from the ground and do not envision uh, let's say autonomousness or uh, computational power on board. We are working also on the second generation of Galileo. Uh, that's uh, an interesting point, in my opinion, is that uh, there we have in, we are inser inserting uh, some uh, technologies that are on the trend that we see in satellite in space in the space sector that are uh, links between intersatellite links, starting to build network of satellites. So the, the these intersatellite link are used to to correct the the timing error that could be uh, present in uh, each of the um, in each of the satellite, and then we have some new uh, new technology like digital configurable antenna, a new kind of propulsion system, propulsion system, and we are the, the the project is ongoing, and the first satellite will be in orbit by two thousand four. Uh, 2024. This as a regard for ah okay we have in, still in this in the field of navigation 
we have uh, we are starting to work on the lunar navigation together with all the trend of the uh, Artemis program. Uh, this actually is uh, a study from uh, funded by by European Space Agency that asked us to to study a lunar radio navigation system and so to start understanding how uh, a constellation orbiting around the, the moon uh, could uh, I mean limiting the number of satellites available because uh, we don't have infrastructure it's I mean uh, costly and uh, for the moment being there is nothing in terms of navigation around the moon so we are studying a system to navigate around the moon and we have uh, research also in the field of uh, orbit determination uh, around the moon using crater for example that in my opinion is a, uh, an interesting activity demonstrating onboard computing that is something we are pushing uh, a lot as trend instead uh, as regard the earth observation uh, field we, we are uh, let's say strongly involved in the copernicus uh, uh, program we are part of uh, 11 up, out of 12 of the um, uh, mission envisioned and we are we are prime contractor for the sentinel one family and sentinel three family together for uh, together with uh, uh, chime and uh, Sim uh, in Roselle program. So we are st strongly involved in the in the Copernicus pro program, either as a prime contractor, so the leading, uh, guiding the, the project, or uh, implementing or working on the payload of such uh, satellites. And one specific constellation of which we are proud as Italian is the, the Cosmos SkyMed one that is a constellation of four satellites funded by the italian space agency that uh, is installed with a synthetic aperture radar in, in x band and this is uh, in orbit since uh, 20, uh, 2007 and it's used uh, as dual role to in civil and uh, defense uh, domain and uh, in the Cosmos SkyMed generation, second generation, on uh, which uh, uh, we have been working in this satellite, we, we, there was an increase. In there the, they are two more satellites in respect to the four uh, ready launched. And we had an increase on the performance and the accuracy, uh, introducing a new payload, a new SAR antenna that has a, a polarization, uh, polarimetric uh, synthetic aperture radar capabilities and it's in the, the, the quality of the observable. Still also in the earth observation domain, domain is interesting to state how this satellite, satellite has been seen as a, a sensor in orbit that just uh, acquire with their payload and uh, download the, to a ground station the, the data. So there is uh, a very limited uh, amount of uh, processing on board or pre-processing uh, on board. And now, uh, given that, that is that the hold for the domain observation navigation, uh, since two years apart, we, we are, it was funded this, um, this group, that is uh, our group, <laughs> uh, that is a research, uh, research, the research area department in which we focus on new technologies and new technologies like artificial intelligence and quantum technologies and uh, this is uh, relevant because uh, i mean it implies that uh, Thales Arena space see in these technologies as a promising uh, technology uh, specifically, we are working on the quantum tech uh, side, and uh, we have also the the CTO that funded a, a group uh, within the company, leading and managing this uh, the quantum tech uh, application. So this is a sign that uh, Thales believe in, in quantum technologies and is willing to work on this domain. Uh, 
in the, in terms of uh, HPC application, I think I mean our domain is uh, uh, one domain that has many many possibilities. There are uh, tons of application. Also, the one that you saw in the past days with the, uh, with the other presentation and uh, less uh, lectures, we have many many application around uh, processing data, detecting. A feature from the, the sense of data, but we have also problem related to the mission planning. So the scheduling of the acquisition that are extremely complex uh, problem uh, that uh, explode in complexity once you increase the, the number of satellites. That is a, a trend that is actually ongoing. Uh, also on the mission analysis, so all the simulation to optimize the, the constellation, and many more altogether. Uh, and how, I mean, ground application are, could be targeted by uh, already under study. We are studying also this kind of application in, uh, in, uh, in Thales, Italy. Uh, more critical are the um, onboard application, more critical in the sense that uh, are many, there is a uh, wide interest in this kind of application. Uh, the issue is, Related to the um, processing that we have on board, as as I stated, there is a minor uh, or no computational power nowadays on board. There is the onboard computing that are uh, far apart, uh, not comparable in terms of performance as per as respect to the uh, non space qualified uh, computer computers. And uh, anyhow, it would be extremely interesting to uh, move the, the processing on board. And there are many, uh, many ways on doing that. Uh, one technology that we are investigating is, uh, uh, of course, machine learning, artificial intelligence to uh, reduce, the, reduce the complexity of the algorithms. Uh, but we see interesting, uh, we see as interesting also the um, study of uh, photonic uh, processor and uh, quantum computing platform that uh, in, I mean, as if seen as general purpose quantum computing, of course, are very far of, um, in terms of being uh, installed on board, but uh, some specific application uh, based on photonic uh, computing could be could be found. Given that uh, the trend in, in the space sector is to increase the number of satellites, increase the, the sensor uh, that uh, are used and to build a network of a processing unit that are uh, as autonomous as possible, that are connected among each other, and they can compute tasks uh, in their orbit. So this is a trend uh, that envision a, a, a quite wide uh, shift in the technology that we have on, on board satellite. Uh, we have to study processing unit. We have to study uh, sensing, new kind of sensing. We have to study a way of connecting and distributing these uh, the, the task and this is uh, like what we expect will, will happen in the, in the coming years and this is a trend that uh, quite match uh, with the research in the, in the domain of uh, artificial intelligence but also quantum tech in terms of sense in communication we have uh, many stuff many things to study in the coming years and given this overview on uh, what who we are what we do and what we are interested on we start the part on quantum technologies we uh, we see the quantum tech uh, we, we try to widen it to widen uh, a bit uh, what uh, ricardo presented this uh, this morning in the sense that uh, we had a morning sp uh, spent on quantum computing and its definition but uh, actually, they all go uh, side by side with the quantum sensing and quantum communication. Uh, that uh, each of the for which each of these uh, topic may require uh, 
hours to be introduced and explain it, but uh, I think they, they are important to be treated together because they connect to each other. Uh, also in, uh, as was mentioned before, I mean, sensing data uh, that has the form of quantum uh, based, uh, quantum formally over quantum formally uh, could be uh, easily computed by a quantum computing machine and vice versa. And the transmission of qubit is a task that is, uh, I mean, all of three influence each other. Each other. Uh, for all these uh, um, platforms, or for all these technologies, we have like the computing as presented this morning is something that will enable new kind of application, uh, exploiting the, the superposition and entanglement of the of quantum mechanic. Uh, we have quantum sensing that uh, will uh, enhance the sensitivity of resolution. Uh, of measurement, still exploiting uh, quantum uh, quantum mechanics, and uh, the same hold for the communication, so transmission of qubits uh, that could uh, um, enable new feature in the transmission, either uh, for ciphering, as you probably know, uh, the quantum key distribution is one of the uh, most popular application in the in the communica quantum communication field. Uh, and indeed, uh, quantum QKD is one of the answer to the problem that was stated this morning on the uh, cracking of uh, RSA uh, using quantum algorithms, since one alternative is to use uh, ciphers that are called post-quantum, that are classical, classical ciphers, but uh, hard to be cracked by a quantum computer, or you can shift the quantum communication uh, side to uh, to encrypt and to be uh, to be resilient to quantum computing. These um, for all these technologies, we have uh, in mind what we have to do, and specifically we have to identify the advantages these technologies could uh, could could have on our mission and product. Uh, we have to um, to, to to study. The, their limits. We have to identify uh, the time frame which we expect in orbit demonstration, but also to define roadmap, industrialization roadmap, uh, and uh, and then develop prototypes to demonstrate the technology. These are uh, our goals as uh, let's see as an industrial partner. So we are use uh, end user for these technologies. We have just to, to interface with the universities. We have to interface with the um, academic partners and with the scope of understanding uh, how far these technologies are and what could be the, the impact. So this is our role as a department. So uh, here we have we have the for these three domain, what are the, um, the, the application we see uh, in, in, in the three in the three field. We have that the, the quantum sensing is something very interesting and also quite close to be uh, close to be to, to achieve an impact on some of the technologies. And we, we see interesting application in the field of uh, accelerometer, gyroscope, gravimeter uh, that could be implemented by quantum uh, sensing over quantum sensing platform that could be used for increasing the um, the attitude control of the of the satellite, but at the same time there is the branch of quantum illumination that uh, try to enhance the the capability of, a, of for example a SAR system by uh, adding to the like uh, intermodulating to the to the signal also uh, quantum states that could uh, enhance somehow include new feature to the to the to the signal we are we are using. We have, of course, the quantum computing that is among the three, maybe the, the one that need uh, still a lot of uh, work to have it ready. As uh, Bertrand said, we probably in 10 to 15 years, we'll see some uh, application. Uh, I, I think that uh, maybe some specific application 
on a specific circuit could be uh, could be implemented and demonstrated in uh, in the coming years but who know we, we will see so we are interested both in the architecture so in the computing platform and and we are interested in, under, in understanding what processor could be uh, could best fit what kind of application in the uh, end observation and navigation domain and the same we are interested in quantum algorithms so to study uh, what are the best algorithms for this uh, for this in our domain for the communication instead we see uh, it, its potential mainly in the in securing the the communication between satellite and securing the 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 meteorological uh, information that are shared in our navigation system so uh, time uh, timing is uh, fundamental in navigation and uh, to 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 cipher this signal is fundamental together with the uh, transmission of uh, of qubit qubit that will enable in the future also like something like distributed quantum computing or uh, anyhow architecture network of a platform that could compute uh, synergically algorithms so what we are doing now is uh, for all this technology uh, we have it's fundamental for us to understand the time span the uh, the time window we envision for this technology to be mature enough or to be considered in our roadmap uh, to be considered in our portfolio of product and so this is a preliminary work we are starting to, to do internally to understand where to to invest those are um, some some of the building block we see uh, as uh, fundamental in each of the three uh, domain communication computing and sensing and we are also trying to match okay what kind of application uh, what kind of application could be implemented in one in, in what product or mission so for example we are seeing we have seen how in galileo uh, constellation could be uh, of interest in in, in ciphering the time transfer uh, protocol uh, that is uh, that will be probably implemented by a fiber cable so uh, we we are trying to match uh, the, the technologies over our constellations Since we 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 live of system engineering in our in our company, I mean the the design of uh, a satellite is a is a long uh, uh, is a long iter, and we we always follow all the steps are fundamental to 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 achieve the goal. And altogether, it's fundamental for us the technology really readiness level that characterizes the maturity of a technology. And we, uh, in, the, in our day work, we, we treat uh, TRL, TRL for any of the technology we treat. That's the first question they, they ask in our company when you talk of a new technology. Okay, well, what's the TRL? What we expect to be the TRL in three years? And uh, we are uh, happy that, uh, it, uh, that we found from ULIC Institute actually this new definition of QTRL. So, the TRL method to the quantum computing world, and, and that's something that help also the industries to to treat with the with their language, let's say. And uh, I hope all that also this kind of methodology will be introduced also on the other branch that for the moment being we have, I didn't see. And uh, uh, these TRL are fundamental in defining the, the industrial roadmap. Uh, that are something of course is fundamental for the for any company and uh, given that uh, i i leave the floor to mattia that will introduce our uh, roadmap and then define the use case uh, and project that we have ongoing Um, good afternoon, all. I'm Mattia Verducci, and um, Tommaso presented 
uh, what kind of uh, uh, applications we can uh, uh, have with quantum technologies in space. But now the question is, uh, uh, how many years do we need to reach uh, the target application? Uh, is these stuffs uh, are only fantasy or uh, yet uh, a six in one? So I want to uh, quick uh, show you our uh, roadmap for quantum tech uh, div divided into uh, computing, uh, sensing and communication. Uh, in this slide, you can see uh, that we are still at the beginning with quantum computing. Uh, among the three branches of quantum tech, quantum computing is, uh, um, in particular for space, is maybe the, the less uh, uh, developed uh, because of, uh, obviously, it's uh, uh, first of all a matter of uh, we have to develop instrument for uh, ground computing and then move it on space. Uh, during these first years, we are studying the, uh, identifying the right platform. We are beginning to study uh, technology and use cases. Uh, uh, later, I will show you uh, what we are doing about quantum computing. Uh, but as you can see, uh, there is a lot to do uh, up to reach potential breakthrough applications like uh, uh, the ones uh, uh, illustrated in this uh, slide. So um, constellation of satellites that are empowered with XPC uh, skills. Uh, and not only, obviously, uh, also uh, ground facilities could be speed up by uh, quantum computing. Um, together with quantum computing, uh, we are also investigating the, um, and we are submitted a, a proposal about photonic processing. So uh, these three activities on the beginning of this road, 2023 and 2024, are activities that are yet uh, started. Uh, and the idea is to reach uh, the uh, space validation of this, uh, um, this, uh, these things uh, uh, up to the uh, in-orbit validation in uh, later than 10-15 uh, years. Um, about sensing, we are uh, instead uh, in a, um, in a uh, more uh, uh, short roadmap because we are uh, uh, yet studying and uh, we have a project uh, um, started on uh, the characterization, the study of uh, quantum sensor for uh, um, some applications like, for example, magnetometry, like uh, uh, radio frequency sensing. In particular, we are we want to study all these kind of sensors, not all. Uh, the one uh, in 2023 is uh, about the superconductive qubit, uh, superconductive circuits, but we want to also investigate the properties of um, atoms, of uh, uh, trapped ions, uh, vacancies in diamond, and so on. So we, this year will be devoted to the study of this platform in order to understand which is the best one for each uh, task. And uh, the idea is to arrive at the point in which we can uh, put our, uh, our quantum instruments on board, both uh, as dedicated payload, for example, for uh, gravitation sensing, for uh, magne magnetometry, uh, or uh, as an augmentation system of our current uh, uh, payload, like, for example, radar systems, uh, quantum radar and uh, and so on for Cosmos Kymed or uh, next generation sentinels. Uh, quantum communication instead is a yet commercial technology because there are several industrial partners also uh, in Europe that are uh, uh, selling uh, plug and play system for uh, quantum key distribution on ground. Uh, we are, uh, uh, I will show you later what we are building. We are uh, studying uh, uh, free space optical link to distribute a uh, uh, secret key between ground and the satellite. Uh, we are constructing a test bed uh, for demonstrating that the quantum key distribution um, is very useful for uh, securing the uh, time and frequency signal. Obviously, there are a lot of data um, that um, are exchanged between ground and satellite, and also between satellite and satellite, that uh, up to now are uh, uh, ciphered with uh, classical uh, algorithms. And we want to improve this kind of security by applying uh, uh, quantum key distribution and uh, to, uh, for example, uh, 
uh, telemetry and control data to um, uh, time signal, for example, for the network of Galileo, and so on. And in this sense, uh, our roadmap is uh, very dense, uh, as you can see, and also in orbit satellite uh, benchmarking is uh, um, foreseen for 2029 because there are several. Uh, uh, European missions that are uh, yet envisioning the, the realization of uh, um, a constellation of uh, uh, quantum key distribution satellite. So this is a, a really um, ready uh, technology. But in particular uh, about all these things, uh, uh, how we we are taking uh, um, these um, these challenges. Uh, so we are part of several consortium. Uh, we are taking part in large uh, international and national programs. Uh, for example, this is Pasquan. Pasquan. Uh, the objective of Pasquan is to develop the next generation of uh, program programmable um, quantum uh, uh, simulators based on uh, atoms. Uh, there were yet uh, another version of past ones. Uh, uh, I believe that uh, an important uh, company in quantum computing, that is Pascal, was born as a startup uh, um, um, thanks to this uh, kind of uh, uh, programs uh, funded by European Union. Uh, within this program, uh, uh, our role is the one of end user. So we are defining, we are helping to defining uh, application uh, and their requirements. Uh, that could be interesting to, um, to test and benchmark with quantum simulators. Uh, not only also uh, platform like uh, NISC devices and uh, emulators are considered into this, uh, into this program that, let me say, uh, in a certain way, uh, uh, make together uh, HPC with uh, uh, quantum computing. Um, this is the same uh, project uh, also explained by uh, Bertrand, so the quantum computing for Earth observation. We are defining a, a set of use cases together with uh, uh, these partners in a consortium led by Julius Center. And uh, we, we are trying to investigate uh, uh, in which uh, space application quantum computing, specific computing, uh, can be useful. And I will show uh, you later some of these use cases. Uh, then there is the Italian PNRR, uh, is uh, mm, a, a part of the next gen funds from a uh, uh, program from the uh, um, European Union. Uh, in Italy, we are developing a national research center on HPC, big data, and quantum computing, together with several companies and uh, academic partners. There is also Cineca and uh, Ricardo uh, in this. Uh, uh, things here, and uh, we are involved in the spoke 10 uh, about quantum computing. In this book, uh, this uh, consortium of companies and universities uh, try to understand uh, um, and to set up uh, strong links between academia and industry in order to understand, uh, to develop, uh, um, to target real size application of quantum computing. Uh, we are inside the uh, European project uh, called the QPilot. Uh, the aim of this project is to uh, develop uh, and provide access to the first federated um, faci European facilities for fabricated and producing uh, in-house uh, quantum technologies. Um, here, we are really interested. Uh, there is a and there is a project that uh, is started within this framework with uh, Fondazione Bruno Kessler at BK. Um, they will produ produce a, a quantum magnetometer uh, based on superconducting circuits. You can see an example on the left. It's a, a ring made of two uh, Joseph and John Junctions. And uh, even small uh, magnetic fields impinging on this device uh, could be detected. So uh, we can use uh, uh, in, for space application this device uh, as, uh, for example, a wide band sensor, a large band antenna, uh, a magnetometer, for example, for uh, positioning, uh, for determining the position, or for uh, attitude control. So there are a lot of applications of uh, magnetometry in, uh, um, in our systems. Um, there is uh, there are a lot of projects. Uh, we are also inside this Italian uh, other Italian national uh, center about uh, most of all sensing about on general quantum science uh, and in this kind in this um, in this uh, 
project uh, we are aiming, we are interested in uh, not only quantum sensing, but also quantum illumination uh, um, setup and quantum key distribution. Uh, then uh, there is uh, uh, this uh, Italian partnership, the Cyber 4.0 uh, is um, divided into two projects. We are working on the real hardware. And as you can see on the right, uh, we are uh, um, building a free space optical links uh, that will work uh, together with a ground-based links in order to share a secret key exploit quantum physics to share a secret key uh, among two different um, locations. And this is a prototype on ground uh, that uh, uh, we aim to put uh, on a satellite during next uh, years. And uh, obviously uh, there are a set of uh, enabling technologies uh, uh, that will, uh, that this kind of, uh, um, of setup will enable. Uh, for example, hybrid uh, um, uh, fiber and optical link, but also the uh, unconditional ciphering of timing distribute of time signal and uh, the concept of uh, uh, trusted node. Here on the right, you can see the receiver. Maybe this is important because uh, this morning, uh, uh, Ricardo said that uh, you have uh, the concept of qubit. So when you miss with a qubit and uh, um, the, the, the hand of the arrows uh, are uh, uh, the way in which we measure qubit. So um, these are, uh, uh, the qubit is encoded in, this, uh, in uh, a photon, in the polarization degree of a photon. Uh, H polarization um, will be, for example, zero. Uh, vertical polarization will be one. And uh, um, there is a polarization big splitter in front of this, uh, this system. And uh, if uh, uh, the photons is uh, uh, deviated, uh, I will measure zero because I will, uh, um, only one detector will click the first, uh, the first uh, one on the left. And if the photon is uh, as a vertical uh, polarization, uh, there will be another detector that will click. And so in this way, this is a, a, to uh, let you say how qubit can be measured uh, in a certain base, in a certain uh, reference system. Uh, this is another project about quantum key distribution, which we are uh, uh, developing an, uh, um, a software simulator of uh, a, a quantum a QKD constellation. So we are doing a lot of things in quantum and in particular in, in, in quantum communication. But now I want just to highlight you some use cases uh, uh, regarding specifically quantum computing, which we are uh, investigating into these uh, projects. And um, one of the main problem we are tackling is the mission planning problem. The mission planning problem is uh, related to the optimal scheduling of satellite observation. Uh, you are a user, for example, military, for example, um, civilian, uh, that uh, um, require to uh, observe a certain uh, surface of the heart. This, uh, uh, obviously, this request uh, cannot be all satisfied. We have to choose, and we have to choose uh, them uh, in an optimal uh, uh, way. And uh, this optimal way involves uh, looking for uh, uh, the optimal solution uh, in uh, two at the nine times m times theta so um, possible configurations where n is the number of satellite uh, each satellite can acquire uh, several uh, um, areas so m is the number of uh, uh, these areas that uh, are requested for each satellite and uh, not only uh, each satellite can acquire each one of these uh, m areas uh, in a certain uh, um, a, a, theta times. There are theta opportunities to, to take this, um, this, uh, this snapshot. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, this is a hard optimization problem in which uh, quantum computing can give uh, an help. And uh, these are the two things we are uh, trying to understand together with our French colleagues uh, um, of applying uh, quantum computing to this problem. Uh, we have the full quantum solution. So um, I said um, this morning on uh, the application of a quantum annealer. So we want to uh, formalize this problem, transfer, translate it, uh, it in a cubo formulation, uh, then mapping into a nice uh, um, uh, 
system uh, reach uh, using an algorithm like, for example, the quantum annealer to uh, uh, found the ground state and then read out, so uh, do a measurement and uh, decode the output in order to find the best solution. The other approach is an hybrid approach in which uh, um, developed by uh, Paris Arena Pace French, in which uh, um, it is uh, used a quantum neural network uh, within a reinforcement learning uh, framework as a policy. And uh, we are yet studying this, uh, these two, um, these two um, solutions. And as you can see, uh, there is not uh, always uh, only one way to, to target the, uh, to, to, to tackle uh, the problem in the quantum world. Uh, another important thing, uh, uh, area of application of quantum processing is the SAR raw data processing. You know that when you acquire the radar data, um, you, uh, if you plot this data, uh, you will see nothing. You will see this uh, noise. Uh, it seems noise. You have to process this data uh, in order to uh, get the image. And this processing is done currently uh, on ground because it involves uh, a lot of fast Fourier transform and inverse for, uh, FFT. Uh, so we are trying to understand how a particular algorithm called the quantum Fourier transform could be useful for this case. The uh, quantum Fourier transform is yet part of many algorithms, like for example, the Shore algorithm, because it is proven that there's an exponential speed up over the classical um, uh, Fourier transform. But uh, uh, there is a problem that uh, when you measure the output, uh, your state uh, collapses uh, into only one uh, um, result. And you don't want this because you, the, you want to. Uh, keep the, uh, all the vector of uh, uh, transformed data. And so the idea is to understand uh, uh, the benefits of quantum Fourier transfer, trans, um, transform when inserted into the pipeline of uh, uh, star processing. This is a problem of image alignment developed by, uh, by uh, our colleagues in France, in which they uh, also uh, try to use uh, mach um, quantum machine learning uh, to uh, optimize the alignment between uh, optical images, because you know uh, when you image a certain area of the of the hertz, uh, the photo will not. Uh, maybe you are seeing, you are looking at the same point from different point of view, and then you have to reconstruct the the, the overall image, or maybe um, the same satellite when pass. Uh, through the same point, uh, acquire with uh, a different geometry, but different, uh, for example, light condition, and so. And so there is a lot of um, there is the problem uh, that is uh, an optimization problem because uh, um, we have to minimize the so-called reprojection error, and also this problem can be taken with um, a, a quantum computing. The phase unbracking problem, uh, um, there is uh, some work that uh, um, this problem is about uh, SAR interferometry. So uh, I have uh, this, um, I have uh, um, the image of the same area taken at different, uh, for example, time. And I want to reconstruct the phase difference because the phase difference can give me a lot of information if uh, we are speaking of coherent acquisition. And so, uh, for example, I can measure uh, very small movement of the ground, like for example, uh, um, for the, this is important for uh, the health status of bridges or uh, after an earthquake. And there is the problem to recover the right uh, uh, the right phase because when you measure the phase, you measure something that is uh, uh, modulo two um, uh, two pi uh, k k is the integer number of uh, round you you do on the uh, geometric circumference. And uh, this is a problem of minimization, and you can tackle this by quantum computing with uh, uh, a quantum maneuver. An important and a bit different uh, use case could be the uh, quantum computing for electromagnetic simulation. Electromagnetic simulation are everywhere in our work. Uh, I have highlighted here two um, applications. For example, we want to um, simulate the electromagnetic response of a certain target on the ground. This is very important for improving target detection application on radar, or for example, to improve the system calibration. But we can also, um, 
but we can also um, apply quantum uh, apply electromagnetic simulation to optimize and improving our antenna uh, design processes. So it's very important to understand how quantum computing could be useful for uh, electromagnetic simulation because you know solving uh, th this um, problem involves the uh, solution, finding a solution of partial differential equations. So the Maxwell equations. And uh, there are a lot of techniques, classically speaking, that uh, are able to do this, but they are really, really uh, hard in terms of the resources, both time and memory. Uh, for example, uh, finite difference methods. Uh, there is this uh, algorithm that is called the, HHA, uh, the HHL algorithm that has been proven. It has been developed in 2008. And um, it has been proven to have uh, an exponential uh, speed up in solving linear systems. So you apply the finite difference uh, um, method to transform your partial differential equation into a linear system. Then you use quantum computing for uh, uh, trying this, uh, for try for um, look for the, the solution. And it has been proved that the calculation of electromagnetic scattering cross-section on a small size of a really toy problem uh, with, uh, in, I believe, um, B-dimensional, uh, it has been proven that this is exponentially faster than the best classic alg algorithm. So we want to study uh, how quantum computing could be useful for this kind of simulation. Okay, so there are a lot of, uh, we, we said a lot of uh, things, and uh, uh, now it's time to answer to this question. We started with, uh, is space ready for the quantum leap? So the answer is no. No, I'm joking. <laughs> is uh, not, uh, not yet. There are a lot of work to do. Uh, we are working, uh, uh, there are a lot of enthusiasm because there are a lot of possibilities. We are working to, try to turn this answer into yes. Uh, when I say not yet, uh, as you can see, because uh, there is a great difference in the maturity of the quantum technologies. Um, for example, uh, uh, quantum communication is yet ready for the market. Quantum sensing um, could be within a few years, but quantum computing for space application is still in its uh, infancy. Um, but obviously, uh, as uh, um, I have uh, uh, shown to you, interesting applications are emerging and there could be potential breakthrough. There is uh, a growing global trend of uh, investing resources in um, quantum application for space and uh, Europe, as uh, said before by uh, Bertrand, and our company strongly are involved and believe in this trend. Um, Thales Alenia, in particular, is looking to make their system as independent as possible and to move computation in orbit. So we believe that uh, the best one uh, way to reach this, uh, this uh, to target this solution is to use uh, hybrid quantum classical computing. So a paradigm in which uh, um, the, the, the course optimization, for example, is done by a classical HPC system. And then uh, there are uh, uh, ad hoc uh, quantum processing units to solve uh, uh, a certain part, uh, a certain tasks, subtasks of the, of the main one. Uh, but now the question is if, uh, are you ready for the quantum leap? Uh, because uh, I, I want to use, to spend this uh, few minutes to, to tell you that uh, uh, enjoy in um, Tales Arena space in Italy. We have a lot of opportunities uh, for students and seniors. We have staff, pos staff position within our team in Rome, as described by Tommaso. We can uh, we have the possibility to start industrial PhD thesis and stages. So uh, all technical background are welcome. Don't think that to work in space you only need to be an aeronautical or uh, aerospace engineer. Uh, in particular, we are looking for uh, uh, computer scientists, uh, experts in HPC, in um, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, quantum physics. And so don't hesitate to get in touch with us uh, for uh, further information. And these are uh, our contacts. Thanks.